All right. Well, hey, thank you everybody for joining us today. And hello to everybody who is visiting from online. For those of you who don't know, we as an initiative for 2020 are trying to get our webcast process set up. So I know driving to DTC for some of you is kind of a, it's a drag. And especially when we leave at like 4 or 5 p.m. and uh, traffic is really nasty coming out of this area, right? So uh, the goal is to get a little bit more coverage for you guys in this area and actually expand our uh, coverage nationally and internationally as well for those people who want to stay up super late internationally or early in the morning, depending. Um, anyways, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if Does anybody here have an interest in blogging or speaking? Dion, do you have ideas that you just want to share, but you have no idea where to put them? No, yeah, maybe, okay. So we just launched the Systems Management Squad. It's sysmansquad.com. Um, you can register to be a contributor or a mentor, or if you've got like an affinity for WordPress, um, you can join us on the support staff as well. But the goal with that is just to be a community-driven kind of blog, right? So if you just don't feel like you've got enough content to throw up or you don't have the what you would consider the skills to do the blogging, but you've got the writing prowess or you want to learn the writing prowess, you know, or learn to speak or any other media really at that point, um, that's the goal with this is to be partnered with mentors who will help you along with your goals and um, give you a space to post that content as well. So join us there, sysmansquad.com, and uh, there's a registration page and some more info about the project. Outside of this, this is our last session for the year. Special thanks to Catapult for sponsoring food. That will be here around three o'clock, and then mega ultra special thanks to Justin and the Patch My PC team for bringing out Mike and Gary. Big claps here. And additionally, if you didn't see the update, there's going to be a ticket given away today to MMS Mall of America edition for 2020 with Five Nights Hotel. What? I know it's like a $2,700 value ticket prize. So uh, also, um, if any of you are government employees, uh, I don't know how that will work out for you. You have to uh, determine your eligibility yourself uh, based on your company policy and you state and local. State employee, it would be okay. All right. <laughs> so anyways, with that, uh, Justin, did you have anything you wanted to say before we get started? No, I don't think so. Did we unmute like, the audio so it would stream? Is I think so. Is it? Are we getting notifications that it's not? Somebody out there, let us know. Right. <laughs> I don't think you're okay, yeah, I think it's working. Okay, cool. Hello, if anybody hello, is hello, on the live stream and it's not working, please shoot us a message on chat. This is our first time doing this and we kind of threw it together in about 30 minutes this afternoon. So we're still learning the process a little bit. Um, but with that, I'm going to pass off to uh, Gary and Mike here for right. Windows as a Service, right? Windows as a Service. Thank you. Is this up? Can you guys hear me okay? Let's try to shout. Is it on? Yeah, yeah this should be on. Yeah, so my name is Mike Terrell. Um, how many of you were here 2016? I think I came and I presented to the user group. Couple hands. All right, that's good. That was all talking about something called UEFI. So I hope everybody is now on uh, UEFI with Secure Boot, right? <laughs> yeah. A couple nods. No, maybe. Well, uh, yeah. Since that time, I've kind of changed a few roles. Uh, gotten a new best friend here who uh, we don't see each other that often. So no, twice as three times this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, this is Gary Block. I'm Gary Block. Uh, I work at Wells Fargo Big Bank. <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, I came from uh, state government, so I used to have 2,400 machines that I was responsible for, and now I have 400,000 machines. Slightly different, but uh, the one thing I have learned from going from even a small environment to a large, it's all the same issues that you're dealing with. It's just that instead of making the deployment to twelve or to twenty four hundred, you make it to four hundred thousand, and also then if you make a mistake, you have a lot more cleanup. But the processes are the same, same issues, just uh, you have to be more careful. Yeah. So who's who's doing Win Ten upgrades? Who's still on Windows Seven? Almost, yeah. Almost. Okay. Oh, good. 
Windows 10 upgrades. You got another four months. Always doing Windows 10 upgrades. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so get used to it, right? It's, that's why we're here to impart our knowledge and help share what we do, how we do it. You might not use everything we do, because uh, we do a lot. Um, but uh, some people say, well, you guys must have a huge team. It's not true. Um, Wow, that's a weird feedback loop. It is. Very nice. Thanks for that. Um, it's it's but, Mike uh, and me, but we are hiring. Yeah. So, so you want to work with us? Um, yeah, you can take bits and pieces of our process, implement them in your own environment. And if they help you out, then great. You're a step ahead of the game, right? Because the clock's ticking for everybody, like you said. And even once you get on to Windows 10, guess what? It's expiring a lot faster than Windows seven was you know well windows 7 is expiring in a month now but you get the point right it's uh 18 months if you're in the spring release 30 months if you're on the fall release and that's only for uh enterprise <coughs> and education so just keep that in mind um let me hit the slide some of our agenda for today uh we're gonna be covering uh, windows as a service surprise um we're gonna be covering some things that might happen in a complex environment. Uh, we're not going to say which one, but it might be a large financial institution that has this particular setup. Um, but one of the things that we're talking about is uh, this does work in pretty much any environment. Uh, grab bits and pieces. We work with a lot of other people in the community who have um, contacted us directly and like, hey, we, we borrowed your process uh, and they just kind of ask a few questions about it. So you can leverage it for small environments. The the beauty of what we've set up is for um, minimizing risk. That's not something we have to, you didn't, you didn't do your slogan. I think we have it later. In the oh, it's not the first slide. Is it, is it the first slide? It is oh, the yeah, first it is. slide. Yeah. So when we came up with the WAS process, it's all about, uh, I think it's backwards actually, minimizing risk and maximizing velocity. Um, we work in a very risk averse environment. People don't like it when they can't get their money. Um, and they're very paranoid about doing any kind of change, let alone an operating system upgrade, right? That's, that's a foreign concept uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so we want to minimize that risk, but we have a large environment, so, and we have a clock that's ticking, so we got to go as fast as possible you can go. So, so that's what it's about. Anybody using uh, the Windows servicing here? In configuration manager there's two ways to do upgrades task sequences or servicing so we got one hand uh, I'm playing with it playing with it yeah, yeah. another one that's in plan for our 1809 we're still on 1709 for the majority okay another hand use both. use both yeah i use the servicing for the machines that are not uh the kind of like jump boxes that people don't are not on it's not the personal ones right. there's nobody there Okay. And then don't have a lot of complicated programs on, so it's good to push that. Yeah, it's a perfect scenario for that. Very simple machines, yeah. lightweight. Yeah. 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 And, and you, if you guys follow us on Twitter, we kind of get in these little Twitter discussions with people about servicing <coughs> over task sequences. Uh, who's familiar with uh, Johan or Widmark? Okay, good. Those of you that aren't, uh, go look him up. He's, like the world's leading OSD expert, he's doing a config mess, days of config mess videos. Um, I think he covered one on task sequences and servicing. Um, so we're not saying don't try servicing. If it works in your environment, absolutely. By all means, go ahead and use it. Um, there are some limitations. There are some advantages. It's simpler. Um, but it's on the applications you got on applications are the big that's our thorn in our side so apps uh, we, we are in a really extremely locked down environment probably uh, Michael probably has a very similar lockdown environments that he works with so he knows what we're talking about um, but yeah so we're not going to go into servicing today uh, we're going to talk all, all about task sequences so there are some great blogs out there Adam Gross has a lot of very good detailed information on servicing and how to leverage some of the additional things that they built into servicing as we've given feedback about the, the lack of customization. So Microsoft is working on it. Yeah, um, we're going to get into 
how we reduce this risk beyond just doing the upgrade, right? So we, we implemented some really cool things, well, at least things that we thought were really cool. Um, of course, wearing that sweater, I don't know if you guys can <laughs> trust us about what's what's really cool or not, but uh, <laughs> uh, but it was uninstalled. Uh, and we'll get into that in a bit because that further helps us reduce our risk and be able to go faster as well. Um, driver management, who likes dealing with drivers? Yeah. Nobody? <laughs> That's right, yeah, drive, it's pain. Um, who has networks, slow networks? A couple hands, okay. So you guys, you guys know our pain. Uh, this, you guys are lucky, apparently. Probably all on fiber connections. Um, so we're gonna get into some of that networking and P2P efficiency. Um, P2P can play a big part uh, in helping reduce your network uh, loads. And then this man here is probably the foremost expert in troubleshooting when it comes to in-place upgrades. Um, Not by choice. <laughs> just because I didn't want to do as much of it, but no, just kidding. Um, yeah, Gary's dug really deep in that, so we're going to have a session on that towards the end. Um, so if you like reading log files, until your eyes are crossed. Um, yeah, this is you should do that before we eat. <laughs> yeah. well, that's true. That's a good point. So, um, and this is your session. This is your time. You guys are here on your time. Interrupt us. You got questions. Yeah. So we'll go through fast. We're going to go through different things. We do have some time if we don't talk too long at the end, hopefully, to do a Q&A. But by all means, stop us. Shoot up the hand. We want to hear from you. We're here for you guys. Yeah. We just ask that you hold your applause till the end. That's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now we're gonna play. We're gonna play some guessing games here. So, anybody have an idea what that number is? Number of endpoints. Close. That's a good, good guess, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit lower than that. <laughs> Number of Windows 10 upgrades. So this is the number of Windows 10 upgrades. We, we jumped from 1709 to 1809. Um, actually, we'll be doing, I think we're just finishing off uh, the last few. When I checked a couple days ago, we were right at about 320, 325 something, or 330. So I think we got, I think I looked this morning, we're, we're under 20K left to go. So we had a target at the end of the year to get as, as much to 1809. So, does anybody know when 1709 goes out of support? April. April. You got it. Yep. So, those of you that are on, still on 1709, you take your vacation and then start working some long days. So, but yeah, so 350, that's what we took from 1709 to 1809. We looked at some of our metrics and um, I think we flipped over to imaging new devices on 1809 around the early September timeframe. And they churn out about 10K, 10K a month. So that makes up for some of that delta that you see. We've got some attrition uh, through lifecycle also. So we've enforced model support. So we don't support anything that, that uh, Dell or HP doesn't support. We block it. Um, so, okay, so 112, what's that number? Who's on Twitter? Who follows me on Twitter? And you right, should you know, the answer. know the answer. That's one. <laughs> that's, that's our top 10 days. Oh, you're still in my thunder here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so our top 10 days when we were pulling our, our stats, metrics, uh, yeah, our top 10 days totaled up to 112,000. And our our single highest 24-hour period was over 14,000. So, yeah. Um, so pretty big numbers. What's this number? Success rate. Success rate, yes. So... That's really good. Awesome. In our process, we track a lot of stuff. 
not as much as like Google tracks on you guys, but um, <laughs> we 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 do it for a couple of reasons. A, it helps us figure out what's working, what's not working. If there's any issues after the upgrade, we can kind of hopefully point to correlate some data. Um, but really why we track it is because we want to give it to our bosses so we can get a big raise of bonus. <laughs> Hasn't um, worked yet, yeah. but. <laughs> um, but no, so this number is, we actually track the number of uh, compat scan attempts, uh, in place upgrade attempts. So there's different phases in the process for those of you that are not familiar with it. Um, we'll, we'll get into a couple slides on that. Um, but this is our combined first time and second time uh, success rates. So I think first time when we did it, the percentage was 95.45%. And so adding in our second time success rate was at 4.6 something percent. So yeah, combined first and second time success rates are 99.61%. So um, this, we can say, yes, we've, we've minimized risk because have pretty high success rates because of this. So. Finishing the task sequence completely, 100%. So no, no rollback? No rollback. Correct. Uh, we don't count support calls. We count if the device made it to... Because we'll get support system. calls because they don't understand the email. Yeah. Because they, oh, they don't know how to read. <laughs> what was your... What did you find your single biggest sticking point? Reboots. Uh, unattended, either user or um, it off. Mike and I support several lines of businesses. So we, we engineer this process, but they still are rec they are still directly responsible for their own areas. And so they'll have like um, competing deployments. And what they'll end up doing is sending a deployment that starts and then they end up rebooting the machine during our deployment. Which is great. Windows upgrade loves being rebooted in the middle of it. Yeah, that first time uh, success rate would have been much higher. Yeah, we, we did catch some of that, like digging into it. Setup is kicked off. Um, external uh, reboot called. It's like the heck is rebooting during the middle of our upgrade? Like why? Yeah. Why is that even happening in the first place? So now is it just a matter of if you do this again, getting better? communications out to what to look for, what not to do. To the mission. We've worked with those lines of businesses to like fix their processes to not impact our processes. And that's helped a lot. Um, the, the second biggest thing is just network connectivity issues that have broken certain things when it needs to reach back. So they're not, the users are never hard down. We've had just a few instances where the machine is just forked. But I mean, it's so small, I can probably count on a hand out of the 350K. So usually they come in the next morning, it tells them, your upgrade failed, don't do anything, it will try again. All right, who wants to take a shot? I think this is our last uh, Q&A quiz. Who wants to take a shot at that number? Uh, Exceptions, uh, no. Outside of the local area network. Oh, successfully upgraded. <coughs> uh, successfully upgraded on VPN. Yeah. That's what I said. I looked at it and I'm like, did we mix our 1709 data with our 1809 data? And then I take out the filter and then, no, <laughs> we didn't. That's all. Uh, from our 1809 metrics. So, yeah, we support a lot of users on VPN. Um, not sure if you guys have VPN users or direct access or whatever. It was kind of funny because the support tech had recently emailed Gary and said, uh, well, it's not advisable to do the upgrade on VPN. It's like, what are you talking about? I do it on VPN over wireless at my house. So, uh, Can it's mostly. Yeah, so. Um, uh, it's both. It does do some reestablishing um, on a reboot. So, without getting into too many details, but depending on your VPN configuration, you can talk to your VPN team to make machine level connections. 
uh, for certain amounts of time. Um, and then sometimes those will swap if there's a user that signs on or this or that, but hopefully a user's not signing on. So um, yeah, that will help you out big time. Uh, cloud management gateway DP can help you out in that area too, if you're buying that. Um, that would be more recommended. Um, we're kind of working towards that path. We're a little bit slower uh, when it comes to embracing uh, certain cloud technologies. Um, but we want to get there because yeah, we still do see some issues with that. So. We, we, we do we that for anything, though. Phase for pre yeah. um, So this just slide kind of gives you guys a little bit of context of uh, when, when I talk about tracking data is we not only track what build you're coming from, so 17.9 and the, the UBR, which is the update build record. That's the three or four digit character after the build. So if you look with the cumulative uh, monthly cumulative updates, there's always a new increment to that. Um, so we track what they're coming from and then what they're going to. Because we service our media uh, on a monthly basis. The last thing we want to do is up upgrade a device. And then all of a sudden, the user goes to the log back on or whatever. And then along comes a one gig uh, cumulative update that they then have to wait another 60 to 90 minutes for to get applied before they can start working again. So um, I don't think we have a section on it, so I can talk about it here. Um, anybody familiar with uh, OSD Builder? A few hands? OK. Um, so we worked with David Segura. So he's kind of the brains behind that. Him and Adam Gross and myself and Gary, we were trying to crack uh, how we could slip in what are called dynamic updates. So you've probably seen little checkboxes there. Uh, in the UI on the task sequence editor. Oh yeah, just check these boxes. Well, we got fat pipes like some of you guys. That might be OK. But you're now talking like a gig of content per machine coming down. And uh, if you have branch networks that are very slow, you will crush those branch networks. You'll make enemies with your network team and the line of business, something you probably don't want to do. So we kind of put our heads together, pulled apart the process of how we can slip in these updates. And we found that there are setup based and component based uh, dynamic updates. And then um, long story short, uh, Segura took it a step further. He just decided to start automating it. And that's what OSD Builder is. So definitely recommend a session on OSD Builder. Uh, Nathan, you guys have that for, for one of your upcoming meetings. Um, so uh, it just automates that whole process. Um, there's an order of operations too. So uh, who's familiar with servicing stack updates? Yeah. Yeah. Servicing stack updates are kind of a pain that you don't know you have, probably. Um, but when you're servicing offline media, it's imperative that you service the media with the servicing stack update and that it come before the cumulative update. Don't. Uh, very bad things happen. Um, so. Uh, OSD Builder takes that all. It'll apply the SSU, the LCU, uh, any .NET updates that you want to do as well. Yes. And uh, actually, also with .NET updates, uh, I'm not a fan of the way that the .NET updates are authored. Uh, they made some changes over the last year, and it was very difficult to distinguish between. 4.7.NET update and a 4.8.NET update. And you could actually dism in a 4.8.NET update on offline media that didn't have 4.8 that prevents 4.7 from being able to be patched. So, um, and then you have to do work to undo that so that you actually can patch it. Um, so, but yeah, we, we I think I got Segura's hotline because whenever I see something, I want something, whenever I just ping him. Um, he's very open to uh, feedback on the tool as well, but definitely use OSD Builder. So we we service it monthly. Um, we usually have a patch no go, go no go call. So we start piloting the day the patches come out, see if there's any issues, that kind of thing. So we're plugged into that whole process. 
Um, we usually do our media, so I did it on Thursday, I think it was. Because I knew I was leaving yesterday. Uh, we run through some updates and do some testing and certification, make sure nothing breaks. And then uh, we do what we call push it to production on the third Tuesday. So take our OS upgrade package, replace what's there, bump it on the VPs, and then any new machine that's built at that point will have that latest month build. So that's kind of how we handle it. Um, we also do, a, uh, so we actually have two OS upgrade packages for 1809. We have what we call pre-prod or pre-production and a production. So Gary and I are huge fans of not touching anything in production. It's locked down everything in our pre-production. Even with uh, some of the sequences, I don't know if we're showing sequences or what, but we've we've duped a lot of our task sequence modules too, because then that gives us the flexibility. If somebody comes to us and say, hey, my widget stopped working after the upgrade, hey. and then we can figure out what the... What the uh, no, Check this out, dude. Uh, we figure out what that band-aid is, we do it in pre-prod, and then they test, they validate it, and we push those changes into production. Once again, very risky verse. Yeah. We've learned the hard way that what seems like a benign change might not be so benign because you didn't factor in all these other weird scenarios that you just didn't think of. So you make a change thinking, oh, this won't impact anything, this will improve things. And then the next morning it's not so good. And then you just figure out what can you blame it on. I <laughs> Resume generating event, right? <laughs> no, like, oh, I think Tom had that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that color didn't come out very well. Sorry about that. Uh, so, who, who's followed our blogs? They should have probably seen this a couple times. If you've been to any of the MMSs, um, we've presented this uh, this year. We presented it for the first time last year at MMS. Um, but this is pretty much the the architecture uh, came up with to meet not only our technical requirements, but some of our non-technical requirements like uh, CR change process stuff that we had to jump through hoops and spin around and twist backwards a couple times. Uh, I don't know if you guys have rigorous change control in place, but um, we wanted something that was going to fit into that model as well as the technical model. Um, I think it's changed a little bit, and we continue to light up some of these features, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, so the first thing we have is uh, what we call pre-assessment phase, um, and that we actually re-engineered for what we call WAS 1809. Um, I think the first WAS we're calling WAS 1.0. That's boring. We wanted to jump to the XX09 numbering scheme. So for WAS 1809, we redid how we do pre-assessment. Now, what pre-assessment, the intentions behind pre-assessment are twofold. Um, prevent a machine from going through that has a known hard blocker, because the last thing we want to do is send it on through, go ahead and upgrade, and then, boom, setup gets a hold of it, says, spits it out, throws it aside, and we're saying, we got a failure because of a hard blocker. So if we know about a hard blocker, we'll create a pre-assessment rule for it. The other use case for those is um, preventing any apps that are not going to work after the fact, or devices, or something of that matter, or devices that we don't want to support. So Microsoft actually does this. So there's a Windows machine at home, probably a few of you. Uh, if you haven't seen 1909 yet, well, guess what? Chances are your machine has more than likely a video card driver or something that they've got a hard blocker in for, and they publicize some of the hard blockers, and some of the hard, hard blockers they don't publicize um, until they work with the, the, the driver manufacturer, whoever it happens to be, to get the fix in, and then usually that gets sent down with an update, and then they lift that hard blocker, and then your machine all of a sudden sees 1909, and you're like, oh, well, there it is. So, so if you were wondering why you didn't see it, chances are your machine has a hard blocker. We do the same thing because last thing we want to do is take, uh, you know, the the teller that's that's sitting there working doing his job, servicing customers, and then <laughs> upgrade, and then can't service customers anymore. That doesn't do the business any good, right? 
um, business doesn't care about an operating system upgrade. It doesn't provide any value to the business, right? Um, staying current, staying secure, sure, but we want to make sure that the machine is just as functional as it was uh, prior to, to going to the new version. So that's what a pre-assessment rule is. What we did this year, though, is we built in some auto remediation because we're lazy and we don't like to do things manually. Um, so if it was a down level app and the app needed to be patched or it needed to be upgraded or whatever, it would drop off into a collection that had that automatic deployment targeted to it. And if everything was working correctly on the machine, like it wasn't a broken machine with client health issues, um, that app would get upgraded, it would get reevaluated, and then it would pass on the next, next phases. So, um, the major change that we did for pre-assessment in 1809 was uh, we had something out of band where we used a custom, uh, what we call Ac Acme database that did a lot of the pre-assessment checks. Um, but we shifted that over to actually using CIs, straight in configuration. Manager. We got some demos on that. So um, that makes it extremely flexible. So pretty cool stuff. Um, if it passes that, it goes on. Someone was asked about pre-caching. Yep. Uh, it goes on to what we call pre cache path scan. So we have a task sequence that's set up specifically to do that. And it caches down the contents that it needs. It runs a path scan in the background. And then we can mark it ready for your schedule at that point. So we were like, well, there's no sense in sending an upgrade to something. We want to run a path scan on it just to make sure it passes, right? Um, and then we can put it in ready mode. So kind of killed two birds with one stone. I get the content down, content's there, might as well run up capacity, and I go from there. So um, for compat scan remediation, what have we seen on there, Gary? I, don't, I think we usually run into uh, too many issues other than like yeah, you, machines that have dropped off the network or... Yeah, or, or just that it had a hard time downloading as much content as it needed, so it just needs to retry enough times to get all the content. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next slide there. So we come down to ready for scheduling. Um, we, we do have a scheduling team. Gary and I don't do the scheduling. We're the engineers. Um, and they have a web portal that our sister automation team built them. And they can go in and, and submit devices to go. Um, there's kind of a, like a two-factor approval system built in if they do over... I think if they do over 50, they have to have a peer uh, approve it. If they do over 5,000, they have to have a manager approve it. Um, so, and then once it does, it'll schedule it in for certain, uh, whatever deployment type is configured. So typically they'll schedule them for a week out if they're required deployments. Um, we pushed something up uh, that was used more this year than we did last year. Last year we pretty much did it for executive tech-led stuff, which we call, called it on-demand last year. Um, but we had some uh, internal uh, targets or goals or whatever. So self-service is a big thing. Um, so we rebranded it to self-service, and we use that more. We want people to be able to see the update, install the update if you want. If you don't, fine. Um, you'll wait till you get the required deployment, basically, that comes. Um, and I think there's one more, which is uh, what we call next available maintenance windows. Um, because we have maintenance windows around each of these day collections, it should only run the upgrade between uh, 8 p.m. and uh, 4 a.m. Correct. The reason for that is, is, oh, shoot, you left your machine off, right? You come in the next day, you got a meeting with your boss or whatever, you're giving a presentation, and then bam, comes along the upgrade, right? And you're like, well, shoot, what am I going to do now? So they get notices, they get the pop-ups, uh, things like that. Um, so seven friendly times. And then after that, depending upon the device type, then there's no restrictions. It's like you left your device off, you power up, you're getting it. Sorry. Uh, you had your chance. Um, for devices that are already defined in maintenance windows, so anybody have call centers? People, yeah, they work long hours. They work weird hours. Um, 
they usually have very specific windows of when they want machines to go. Um, ours do too, so we created a special option, which is next available maintenance window. And it, we don't know when that is. We just see that it's in a maintenance window, and then it could be Friday night at midnight. It could be Saturday. It could be the third Saturday, whatever. It'll just get scheduled. And it'll run during the window. So that's worked out well for kiosk type systems and just other things we don't worry about. So, All right. Um, yep, we do some pre-flight uh, checks also before the, uh, at the start of the sequence. Um, and then the upgrade kicks off. And then hopefully we're successful. So hopefully I didn't take too much time on, on that. But that's our process. And so when we get into this, and there's extensive blogs. Um, I've got a lot of kind of how it's all laid out. On my blog, Gary's got a lot of sample sequences that kind of match what each of those phases do, that kind of thing, um, that you can go, definitely go check out. Or you can just hit us up and see us about it. So. All right. Um, so in our environment, we, we, we need to surface a lot of data because Mike and I don't want to be the ones taking action on it. So we make a lot of reports so hopefully other people can be educated and take action on uh, whatever's going on. Uh, so one of the first reports, uh, just to kind of get an overall idea of where machines are, what's in process, is we have a we, we have a, a select, uh, well-defined group of collections that we use for our, our WAS process. And so then we have a report that pulls in all of those different collections and tells us uh, how many are in each collection and also tells us the collection status. Uh, the collection status is actually really handy to see if there's any changes going on currently as that number might be changing based upon if something has been added or removed. So then uh, people would be like, hey, why don't I see a machine that I thought was supposed to be in a collection? We can just quick pull up this report. Well, that, that collection is currently uh, churning, trying to finish its evaluation. So just wait until it says ready and then let me know. And then we'll actually look into it. Until then, don't bother me. So interesting thing around collections is um, we don't do a uh, majority of these are not query based collections. They're direct membership collections. And we've had uh, some pretty heated discussions in our own internal <laughs> team about which is the best way to go about these things. And the reason why they're direct membership rules is because if we did something off a of hardware inventory, but well, we would need to change that key, send up a hardware inventory, wait for it to get processed, and then kick off a collection evaluation in order for that machine to get pulled out. Whereas a direct membership rule, uh, we can just have our automation just pluck, pluck that out. So um, now for our environment, which is a CAS and three primaries for 400,000 devices, um, we figured out what our scale was, uh, not this year, but last year. Uh, and we started having some provider errors about the time it hit about 80,000 direct membership rules on collection. So we um, figured if we either added more providers or more memory to the providers, we could have exceeded that. But um, that's always the question that people have. Well, how many direct membership rules are supported? And I don't think there's a number for what's supported. but that's just what we ran into. So it's pretty big. And we do have some alerts that go off as some of these collections start stacking up. We'll start getting alert emails and say, hey, this collection is, what is our 60 or 65,000 yep. is our first alert that we get. So, but luckily things move through pretty quickly. Okay. All right. Um, so as we're talking about our pre assessment, uh, we have uh, reports for that too. So as machines get added into pre-assessment, uh, they'll start showing up in the reports. Uh, hopefully, they, they typically don't show up in the report, which means they just passed and went through. If they show up in the report, they want to know uh, what's going on, why isn't it passing. Uh, so we've got several different reports. This is a pretty high-level one where it just says the, the compliance of specific uh, rules that we have. Um, so in this one, we have all the different softwares that uh, we're checking for. And if it's a mismatch, it will show up as not compliant. Um, hardware unsupported models, because like Mike was saying earlier, we only support certain models. So if a, a certain model goes into the upgrade process, we will actually say, nope, sorry, we're not supporting this model. Uh, and you 
don't get to go any further. Uh, but the biggest reason we have this is to prevent people with certain applications from trying to upgrade because we know that odds are good after the upgrade, even though the upgrade itself is successful, they can't do their work because the app that they rely on for their day-to-day -day job has been uh, pulled out from underneath it. Typically, I would say it's not Windows' fault. They always like to blame Windows, but it's usually because uh, they're doing some really wonky things with their application to make it work in the first place. Yep, and you might notice uh, this one down here. Well, he can probably read it. None of you can. Oh. Big manager client. Oh, yeah. Who, who knows of user voice? Yeah, a couple, couple of you. If you go to configurationmanager.uservoice.com, Microsoft runs that site, and they take feedback on what you would like to see in SCAM or what you'd like to see improved in SCAM. And we've filed quite a bit of feedback, and we see that we get a lot of our uh, feedback granted, actually. Um, and so when we get a new version of CM, we want to make sure that we take advantage of whatever's in there, right? And I forget what they brought in 19. Did we enforce 1906, or was it 1902? 1902 is when they added the run script features that we needed. Yep. That's good, definitely. Um, so yeah, we'll enforce the CM client even. So if it happens to be down level, uh, we'll make sure that it gets upgraded so that that new functionality that's in the task sequence engine, we can actually use it and it doesn't get to that point in the task sequence and yeah. blow up. We, we found that uh, we got 1902 on the server side. We're like, let's take advantage of some of these things. And then some upgrades started failing. And then it's like, oh, <laughs> it would hit that, that run uh, run PowerShell step, and that's where I was failing. But like, I know my code is good, and then I realized I was a down level client and just didn't have any clue what to do with that step. So, anytime they add a step or change a step, and you take advantage of that new functionality, make sure your clients are at that same level. Okay, uh, so more about pre assessment. Uh, inevitably, Mike and I would always be asked, So, what are you actually checking for? Um, and even though we're technically not the ones who make the rules, like people tell us what to check for, we become the source of truth because we conglomerate everything. And we're the people that are like the most sensical when we talk to them. Um, so we get asked questions all the time. So it's like, okay, I'm done like opening the council, looking at the CI, and then reporting back to what we're looking for. So I wrote a report that tells them exactly what they want to know. It tells us the name of the CI, it tells us the um, what it what is required to be compliant, and then if they want to see how to actually run it themselves, I actually put the, the actual CI PowerShell because most of our CIs are PowerShell driven to report compliant, non-compliant, so they can actually just copy and paste the code right out of the report, run it on a machine, and see if it's going to be compliant or non-compliant. Uh, and this has helped immensely because a lot of times they'll send it, and I just send the link back, like figure it out yourself. How are you? So, but yeah, reporting. Yeah, so um, for, for that one, we're actually just checking, is, is the manufacturer Lenovo? If it is, it's not compliant, because um, Big Bank doesn't support Lenovo. I didn't say that. Pre-assessment, pre-fight. OK, this is where it's going to get hairy as I try to figure out uh, I'm not going to get into the reasons why, but. OK, so that's a good question. How many models are we supporting? And I think uh, we're supporting around 45 hardware models for in-place upgrade. Uh, uh, stink. Okay, that. that Gary was Town, not. we support a few less than, than <laughs> Gary Town. It is. Down. It is shrinking down. Yep. <laughs> Definitely shrinking down, and and you know uh, other parts of the business like to throw compliance and regulation at us, <laughs> so it gives us a chance to throw compliance and regulation back. Being like, well, sorry, Dell doesn't support it or HP doesn't support it, so it needs to be life cycle. We need to get that off the wire to 
because it's a compliance issue at that point. They're not issuing BIOS firmware releases for it. <laughs> driver releases might have CVEs or something like that it's got to go mm. and it's eight years old exactly um, there's I think there's one little group that's kind of a an exception to that rule because they run some interesting hardware but uh, okay. yeah for the most part uh, it has consolidated now and they're buying more and bigger blocks so we've got more of one model than probably most of the companies in here have in total, so. All right, <clears throat> so our pre-assessments are, are just CIs. Um, so it's it's no, Mike and I in our whole process, we wanna be as transparent as possible. So we use basically out of box tech wherever we can. So that's not a black box and anybody who knows config man can go in and understand exactly what we're doing or through the reports because um, the last thing we want is a finger point at us saying that we're going cowboy or rogue when while that might be true we're going to really hide that but make everything else completely transparent uh, so our using ci's uh it, it's made life really uh quite nice because we can actually um using powershell get any information we want from a computer using hardware inventory that was much more difficult Whereas the CI, we can uh, look at files, we can look at applications, uh, versions, whatever we want to say, if it has this, then it's compliant. If it doesn't have this, or our vice versa, if it has this, then it's not compliant for sure. Um, so then using CIs, uh, we have that in one, what we call our, our WAS 1809 baseline. And the CI processing is done at the client too. So yes. It's not, I don't know, server somewhere that's trying to munch through hardware inventory data or yep. this or that. Um, it's actually done on the client. And the client just sends up compliant or not compliant. At that Come point. on. It's very lightweight. Oh. You have to be conscious of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Could we remediate it from there? Uh, you can. You can. It depends upon if it's able to be. Yeah, you can't change a model. Yeah. You can't change the OS lang base so language, things like that. We do have collections based upon non-compliance. So, like for a lot of applications, if they're non-compliant, they get automatically populated into a collection, which is then targeted with the proper application version. So then there is auto remediation for some of them. But yeah, like model, uh, not enough memory. Um, Correct. Yes. Yes. But yep. Um, so another big ask that we had was uh, when workstation techs were trying to remediate something, they didn't know if they were successful in remediating something to know if we run through the upgrade. When we had hardware inventory, then they would try to like hit the button to run a hardware inventory after they think they fixed it, wait for the reports to all update, and then see if it was compliant or non compliant. And, Based upon how we were doing it last time, it could be like six hours before they could really know if it was going to be. Now that we switched to this, um, it's all done on the workstation. So all they had to do is fix what they think. They can go into the on the workstation level itself and check to see if it's compliant now. And so, like on this machine, uh, it has the baseline of, to it and it is not compliant. So then a tech could go in here. Pull up the report, scroll down. Oh, hey, look, that's non-compliant. I thought I had a better reason, but anyway, it's non-compliant, and it will tell them exactly which rule it was, so that they can go in here and uh, fix it. And this machine's already been upgraded, so it doesn't want to uh, allow the upgrade again. So that is one of the rules that we have. It has to be. Uh, a certain version of Windows 10 or lower for it to allow the upgrade. Yeah, and so a key thing too that you might notice is that <clears throat> some of them are required, whereas some of them are optional. So anything that's software, we make is optional. So we do a detection to see if that software is on the device first. If it's on the device, then it's applicable. But if it's not, we're not going to fail it because it doesn't have the software. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When I, when I first set up the baseline, I didn't think of that. And so I was getting all these machines that uh, were, were failing the 
pre-assessment um, because of like an obscure application. It's like, I know this app isn't installed on these. Why are they all failing? And then Mike's like, well, here you know, nuts. You gotta, <laughs> anyway, it was, a, it was a good learning moment for me. All right. So that is how we do pre-assessment and but yeah, that's that's invaluable for like a tech, right? Because it's something that's right out of the box, right in front of them if they're in front of the machine or RDP machine, and it's a built-in report and it's right there. So back to pros and cons of not to bash on servicing, but like you can't get that with servicing today, right? <laughs> that's native CIs in configuration. That's all it is. So who uses CIs extensively in their environments? Just a handful of people. Yeah, I think it's one of the most powerful features of Configuration Manager, but probably the most underutilized. Because when you start getting into compliance, um, it's what you can do with it is incredible. If you paste some PowerShell in and boom, now I can do compliance, non-compliance, remediation on certain things. Like if it's yeah, who's going to be using them on? <laughs> um, but yeah, if it's just a registry team, you know, managing drift for like registry keys and things like that, you're going to have it change that registry values back to what it should be, you know, and you get built in reporting through config manager. So, like for GPOs, it's really hard to determine, okay, it's forced on a setting. Like, how do I report on a GPO? <coughs> Run an RSOP on the client. If there's no centralized collection point for that. So, yeah, CIs are great. Uh, that report is built into config then. You just go into in here and then, yep, and then just view report on the baseline. And so that report is also, it's in WMI and that is how we leverage it during a task sequence. It, um, it does require elevation. Though. Yeah, for this. So an end user like if you're on the phone with the end user, you're not going to be able to say hit review your report because they'll get prompted. That would be a good user voice item, actually. I know. I don't know why they can't see that. That should actually be in Software Center, a tab for compliance, and then see what's not compliant. Why do they have compliance? Right. It's like who does their UI? All right. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm kind of skipping around because I need to revert this one for another demo because <laughs> um, the other machine I was going to demo on isn't working. But so OS on install, which we will get to uh, a little bit later. Um, sorry for being kind of all over the place, but uh, we're using OS on install. I'm just going to do the demo. We'll explain it more later. But uh, in this demo, uh, you run the task sequence. It pops up a box, and we'll get into more details about that too. It tells them how many days they have left to go back to the previous version, and then asks for some information. So my apps didn't work. Chrome didn't work. Yeah, let's go with that. Is it on me in the in the other tab? Uh, PS2, Microsoft mouse didn't work. Other reasons. I uh, used to have kittens on my wallpaper. <laughs> and um, so that. The, the drop down. So this is all PowerShell uh, driven UI here. Uh, it's just a WPF form and PowerShell in the background. And PowerShell is actually scraping all that information right off. Yep, all the installed applications right off the machine. So it'd be machine Every machine is going to have so it's exactly. Like it's oh. it's all yeah. dynamic. Mike and I don't like hard coding anything because we want our processes to magically work for everything. Um, and then the name is actually pulled from whatever is the account logged on. All right. What if they say no, they can't contact Well, then we just don't contact them. But it still grabs to whoever the user was and, and records that. Um, but just do yeah. that because certain lines of business are really weird about text contacting oh. users. So. No. And then it just finishes the task sequence which takes just a few seconds as it's recording things to, I wonder if I can pull this up or am I going to be too slow? Come on. Okay. So everybody knows when you upgrade, 
It dumps the old down level version. Yes, windows.old. Um, so inside of windows.old is essentially your down level version. In this case, it was 1709. So what we're doing is we actually mount 1709 um, and we inject a bunch of stuff back into the past into 1709 so that this process works properly. And then when it's back in 1709, it has that stuff that we just injected in it. Uh, so we mount the registry and stuff out of 1709, write a bunch of stuff into it, close the registry, and then continue the process. And that's how we do our reporting. We'll get into more details because Gary jumped way, way I ahead. I did. I just, I needed yeah. this machine to revert. I don't have my full lab. I just got a ZBook, which I love. Not that I'm like promoting one vendor and above another, but I like HP. Um, so I am promoting one. <laughs> uh, but I just got a ZBook, so I copied a good chunk of my lab over to it. And I just didn't copy all of my <laughs> normal stuff. So since we're to this point, like this is almost identical, whether it's a virtual machine or a physical machine. Like people didn't believe this. We said that you can go back in three to five minutes. Managers just laughed at us, like, oh, you yeah, want them to wait another two hours? An hour and a half, two hours to upgrade. Are you saying I can go back to, in five minutes? We don't believe you. And I can do it at home on my wireless through VPN? Yeah, sure. Uh, oh. My boss, uh, he even tested it. He's like, yeah, I'm going to test it. And I'm like, go right ahead. Not that I have anything to worry about. Um, and he's like, yeah, we're great. <laughs> I was like, yes. A success, uh, but no, literally it's three, three to five minutes. Um, this is a single core VM with two gigs of RAM. Please keep that in mind. If I had given it more resources, it would be faster. Now, this is a feature that we would like to see Microsoft actually uh, make more enterprise ready. So I presented on this at uh, MMS Desert. Desert Edition. I'm from Phoenix. It's cold here. Um, <laughs> it's hot here. And it was about a year ago this month where I had noticed this, this little command, JISM command, that they had added in. Shoot, now I'm really stealing, stealing thunder. Um, where you just pulled the presentation. So <laughs> um, I presented it with uh, this session with Michael Niehaus, and um, I thought it was the coolest thing ever because prior to, I think it was 1803 up, uh, you couldn't invoke this programmatically, meaning you, have, you can hit your start button on your machine and you can just type, like, go back or whatever. It'll pull up a little thing that says go back to previous build. Say, yes, I want to do that. You'll see a blue box that looks like the one that Gary filled out that looks very similar uh, because I'm not very creative and I just copied their form and then added a couple fields that we wanted and made it a little more intelligent of with the drop down stuff we talked about. Um, what Sorry. I didn't know at the time, my colleague here was on maternity leave for like four months. He's good at finding bugs. So we started doing this in January. Yeah, just January of this year, actually, when he came back. And he's like, you realize that machine is completely borked. And okay. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, the client is hosed. It's unmanaged. Services are in a hung, nasty, hung state. It's just all kinds of things, right? So maybe it's more intended for uh, the home user scenario, but we would like to see Microsoft bring that to work. So what did we do? We, we honkered down because this was something that I really, really, really wanted to do. Gary has a lot of the, the genius stuff back end um, for the way that we make it work. Uh, through like scheduled tasks and old OS and things like that that will actually pull the client out of provisioning mode. That's something that happens. They added that feature in 1906. Two? I don't remember. Two. Getting old. Um, but it's like 24 hours, but I think it's configurable. Oh, it's it's 48 hours that automatically pulls hours. out, and that is 1906. Yeah. Um, but that's the only thing that's in there. Uh, your client's still going to be pretty host uh, if you try to do that without uh, borrowing some of the sample tasks sequences from Gary's blog. Um, 
but yeah, we'd like to see them bring that more because I think in the enterprise space is who cares if you bork a home user's machine? What if they just stop like browsing Facebook and playing solitaire and they actually go read a book or something, right? Um, you know, but you bork a, a banker's machine and there's a little bit different uh, consequences there. So um, we'd like to see them invest more in this feature uh, to make it enterprise ready. Yeah, yeah. So, so now this is. Oh, I can do. Oh, yes, ready? there is one. I created one like a year ago. Zoom. In. Yeah, we want you guys to crowdsource our user voice items too. So you get more raffle tickets for the. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's see if this is. Is that the one? Yeah, cool. It's finished. Oh, it's uninstall is successful. Yay! It's back at at seventeen oh nine from nineteen oh nine, and all that information is dynamic. It collects all that. We 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 stamp a ton of information during the the process. As Mike alluded to earlier, what we're coming from, where we're going. Uh, so we have all that for metrics, but then I can also use that for things like this, like where we want dialogues to be dynamic to the end user, to let them know where they have been and where they're going. All right. Not many. Oh, ones that reverted back? Yeah. Uh, not too many. Um, no. I, I didn't check that metric. I'll probably try to pull it next week for our, our senior leadership, but... Um, we only made it available to people that did self-service. Um, and the reason for that is um, self-service was an available deployment. So if you were in one of the day deployments, but we don't move those machines out for like seven days because we want them to retry if, if they keep going. So they have that persistent required deployment policy. Um, so we only made it available for self-service. We didn't put... They only put like a couple thousand machines through the yeah. self-service um, process. It wasn't so, that big yet. And, so um, what was for us, OS uninstall was kind of like that safety net. Like uh, a lot of people don't want to go out on the tightrope. They, they think like it might be kind of fun, but I'm not trying it. Uh, and then we like, oh, yeah, we got this OS uninstall. I was like throwing a safety net out there. And they're like, oh, yeah, we can try that. There's a safety net now. So even if we don't make it, at least we can, you know, not die. Yeah, so the ones that could do OS uninstall, it was a pull of maybe 2,000 to 3,000 total. And out of that, um, a few people tested it, but none of them actually had to use it, right? Because something didn't work. But, but we're going to promote it. We're going we're gonna to turn into sales guys uh, next year, and we're going to just try to sell it internally because that's what it is. It's All marketing right. and it's saying, hey, Go ahead and try it, right? And they asked for it on the required deployments, but I said no. I'm like, could we technically do it? Probably could, but we'd have to re—we'd have to engineer uh, even more processes on it. But we want to shift people more to self-service, at least the ones that are eligible for self-service. So there's certain groups within our organization that. No, they're just controlled deployments. They do them off hours. But, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to. Oh, yeah. The, the, the recent. Uh, what just rolled out? 1909. 1909. 1903 to 1909. I uninstalled that. Somebody was on Twitter like, oh, you can remove that. I just went in and uninstalled it and uninstalled it in 10 minutes. Yeah, 1903 to 1909 is a special edge case. Don't expect that moving forward. Okay. I thought that was. A no, it's like 1903 plus. Just think of it that way. They just changed the number and turned on a couple of dials. Flip the build number. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to wrap this segment up really soon because Pete's is here, but I just wanted to explain one thing. Uh, so the OS on install, uh, I have scheduled tasks that uh, are created during upgrade, and then all those scripts get placed when you're running the OS on install. It's dumping those into the windows.old, so when you're actually back on 1709, it has what it needs to fix itself. But um, And then I, I like to keep logs of everything, so I write logging into my scripts. 
So like if in my script you see CM trace log, that's what's powering this right now. Um, so the first thing is it's doing is it's checking, hey, I'm in provisioning mode. So I came back into 1709, saw it was in provisioning mode. So then I was removing it from provisioning mode and giving itself 30 seconds, it's rechecking. It's no longer in provisioning mode. And then I kick off a CCM service and run into an eval. So it triggers the eval. And then I give it five minutes for things to kind of, you know, work themselves out before I start doing anything else. In that time, uh, I have another scheduled test. Because as you saw, I, I hijacked the legal text for a lot of my end user communication. So it said, you know, you reverted back to 1709. Well, I don't want that to stay there after they've logged in. So I've got another scheduled task, and that logs in here too, saying, oh, I've changed the legal text back to the default, which is welcome, um, and then some other blah, but I only care about the one line, because if I know the one line's changed, I know both have. And then uh, it will continue to go on script. i got one more minute before I start seeing uh, the next sequence of doing a bunch of stuff. Um, but this way, because it takes, after you OS uninstall, before the client is fully manageable, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes for it to do all of this stuff. In the script, I have it written so um, it doesn't clean up the healing process until it's completely done. So that way, if a user reboots it, uh, it will pick up, up pretty close to where it left off. And then once it's actually completely fixed everything, it, it removes all of the scheduled tasks that it needed and removes the scripts and stuff like that so that there's like no trace that it happened and then resets a bunch of the registry metrics that we need. <coughs> That's the, the, the magic sauce of OS on install. Yeah, because keep in mind, it, it's coming back to a point in time where it was in the middle of a task seat that's being upgraded. This is kind of like a snapshot of time, basically. And we got a great slide to explain that process a little bit later, too, when we hit the troubleshooting. My name is Justin Chalfant. I'm the founder of Patch My PC. Uh, we're actually based in Castle Rock, so not too far from here. So usually when we're local, I always <clears throat> ask the audience, how many of you guys are using the product to see how we're scaling as we come here every six months or so? About five or so. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So the way that uh, we do our sessions is basically walk you through our product, what it looks like to set up within Config Manager, uh, and how we can essentially go from not having any third-party apps or third-party updates to having everything configured in about 30 minutes or so. So uh, within the lab we have, we can see we don't currently have anything going on. So we don't have any third-party patches, just some Microsoft stuff. And we don't have any apps. So we can see everything's just kind of empty. We're starting from just like if you were to go download the trial, same, same thing where we're at now. So on the trial page, first thing you would do is download our publishing tool. So this is an MSI. It's only about four mag, super lightweight. This gets installed in your top level software update point. So uh, if your sub is remote from your main site server, it would go on that remote machine. If it's co-located and it's all in one, you would install it there. So pretty basic, we'll just go through the typical MSI here and get that launched. Now, uh, if you're just trying this out, like if, if this demo looks cool and you wanna try it out within your environment, on this same download page, there's two options. So you can get a full 30 day trial that would give you a unique URL and that will give you access to every single product we support. So 300 and some products you could trial within your site. Now, um, jumping in the UI, if you don't wanna send us any of your info, we do have what we call a public trial mode that you can use by checking this box. So if you do the public trial, it's gonna limit you to a smaller set of products just to validate you can get updates published, you can get apps created, um, just for validation purposes. But in this case, I'm gonna uncheck that, and we can see that we now have the full list of products that we can enable for updates and apps within SCCM. So as far as prereqs go, the only real thing that you have to have configured if you wanna use the software updates feature is a signing certificate. So this is used to allow your config man clients to know that these updates that we're publishing are trusted. So uh, we need to have like a source of authority since they're not coming directly from Microsoft. You need to have a code signing cert in place. Now this has actually got quite a bit easier in Config Man 18.06 or newer. So within that build of current branch about a year ago, actually I guess about a year and four months ago, they added a new option in the software update point for third party updates. So if we come in here and choose to enable third-party updates in our software update point, 
and choose the option to let SCCM manage the cert, what will happen is when we trigger our software update point sync, after enabling that, just go ahead and sync our updates. If we look at the wsyncmanager.log for that sync, what we're going to notice here is that it's going to actually create a cert for us. So you don't have to manually go self-sign or even import a cert from a CA if you don't want to. Now that's still an option. If you wanted to use a certificate authority, you could import a co-signing cert from your CA directly within our tool. But if you say, hey, I don't want to manage that, I'll just let SCCM create my cert and also deploy it to clients. We can now let that handle all the prereqs for you. So if I were to reopen our UI, we should see that we've now detected that certificate that's required based on SCCM creating that for us. So we now have our cert. If we come back into our console and look at the software update point, we can also see the certificate that shows there, right? So if we come back in here, we can see the cert was generated and it's now ready to start publishing updates using that cert that ConfigMan created. Now, from the client perspective, there's only one client policy. I think the console is going to crash. So I updated to 1912 yesterday when it came out. And I've had a few console crashes, so we're living on the edge here in this demo. So there is a client setting. So you, after you have your third-party cert configured, whether that's through like a certificate authority that you import or just letting SCCM self-sign and you deploy the clients, there's only one client setting you enable to allow your clients to install third-party updates. So previously, these two configs would be done using a GPO. But now if you're on 18.06 or newer, you can basically eliminate handling the certificate and allowing third-party updates from your GPOs directly to SCCM. So as a Figman admin, that usually helps. Okay. Now, feel free to ask questions too, like as we go throughout this. Usually these are really interactive and it makes just everything more valuable for everybody. So uh, there's kind of two concepts here. So the first one is going to be updates. So we have the capability to publish third-party updates to SCCM that you can use to patch existing products that are out of date. So they're going to come into our configman console as a software update, and you would deploy that just like any other Microsoft update uh, that you'd be using today. Um, but that only covered uh, one of the problems, right? So we would still have to initially package them to use in your sequences or collections to get that third party app out there. So what we uh, implemented recently was applications as well. So the way that this works is we basically have an update and an apps tab. It all lists the products that we support here. Let me just jump over to our products page. Okay. So currently we're at around 300 and some odd third party apps. So you can go to this page to see kind of where we're at today. Now what's cool if we don't have a product that you may be using internally, we do have a user voice where you can come in and submit new product requests. So this is where we kind of track uh, new requests that we're getting from our customers. And you can kind of monitor like what status we're at internally for new products that our customers are requesting. <coughs> so, uh, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is start enabling some products to publish as a software update. So uh, if we just expand this out, we can see we have kind of that full list that was also reflected on the web page. Now, since it is a really long list of products, and you may or may not know like what's actually applicable within your site, we have this database scan feature. So you just put in your SCCM database and the server name and click query. Uh, what this is going to do is it's going to go out and look at your hardware inventory based on installer <coughs> paths, and it will compare based on all the products that we support, how many of those already exist within your environment. So you don't have to go kind of guess and choose, you know, I think I have this, I'm not really sure. You can actually go scan based on hardware inventory to understand how many products you could get from day one, right? So a lot of our customers may actually do the scan and trial mode and then export it to CSV for uh, like showing their management. Question? That was my question. Yeah. If we scan in trial mode, we'll see everything. Yeah. So in trial mode, you will see every product, uh, even if you don't use a URL. So obviously that's helpful for determining like the value you would get the number of products. Did you yep. do anything fancy in hardware? parts of SCCM for this to happen? Uh, no, no. So you, you don't need to extend any hardware inventory classes. This would all be native. Wow. So it's looking at the installed applications view. 
which would be standard with hardware inventory being That's great. I didn't do this part yet. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely helpful. It's been out a while, probably about six months, so we've had it for a little bit now. Uh, and what's also helpful about this, so let's say you wanted to enable everything based on being detected. Within a click or two, you could essentially have all the products be detected, enabled, without guessing anything, right? Um, but also back on that screen, we also have this option to uh, configure the scan to happen at every sync. So for example, let's say that you wanted to set a threshold that says, uh, I want to enable products based on them being installed on 10 devices. Um, so if they weren't on 10 when you initially configured this, but then they were in the future, you would have the ability based on your sync schedule, it's going to evaluate if anything's changed and if it should then enable products. This can also be used for any new products that we add in the future as well. So let's say that there was a new request in user voice, we shipped it, we would pull that down at each sync and check whether it's installed so you could have products automatically enabled without you having to do anything. Um, so it's pretty cool. So if you want to enable that automation. Question, is there, sure. any, it, would there be any way to attach alerting to that or? There is, okay. yeah. Sweet. We'll That's, talk about the alerts tab in a second. That's it's actually pretty cool. All right, so for the demonstration though, um, we're not gonna enable every product just for time's sake, but we are gonna enable Chrome and Java for an update. Now, before we do that, I'm gonna cover some of the customizations that we can apply at the all products level. So this will recursively apply to all child products you enable within here. So first one is you can choose whether you want to automatically close any third party app processes prior to the update. So if you want to make sure you don't have files in use, you have that capability. Alternatively, you can choose to skip the update if it's in use. Um, these days, the majority of products are generally pretty good at updating while in use. You may just get a restart required um, for most, yeah. So if you choose skip, does it try again on another save? Yeah, if, if you choose skip, it would try again at the next software update to form an evaluation cycle on the client based on that schedule. Yep. Uh, we can delete shortcuts, products like Chrome that put all users uh, desktop shortcut. We can get rid of that. We can turn off the product self updater. So if you want to make sure that you're kind of managing updates globally, right click option to do all of that. And then one of the more helpful ones that we can do is enable logging. Um, so this one's actually pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to go copy a UNC path. That's going to be kind of like a standard share for logs. And we're going to enable logging. So we have a few options here that are relevant. So uh, the first one is just enabling logging. So if there's any EXE or MSI based products, we can have the vendors install log for that update or app install get generated into a folder. By default, we put a subfolder of CCM logs. Okay. And then alternatively, if you want to copy any failed installations to a, a, a secondary location, in our case, we're going to use a UNC path. So any updates that fell, meaning they give a non-zero exit code, the verbose logging of those EXE or MSI installers will be copied that path so you could troubleshoot rather than just getting like a generic 1603 reported back to SCCM. Yeah, it's the fatal error that doesn't really help you with anything. <laughs> we all know that one. All right, cool. So we're going to then enable Google Chrome. Right clicking Chrome, we can see we have all the global options we enabled. But at the product level, there's a few additional options that you can apply. Um, so for Chrome, just as an example, we're going to do a post update script. Um, so looking over at our scripts, we're going to run a PowerShell script that is setting the Chrome homepage. So anytime a Chrome update applies, this script would then run to make sure the homepage is always how we want it. It also configures a few of the password policies within Chrome as well. As far as the file types go for pre and post script, we can use batch, VB script, PowerShell, and we can even have EXEs and MSIs as a pre or post action, depending on if you want to tie things in and make it a bit interesting. Are they typing your policy? The PowerShell script? Um, it's a good question. I, I think we, we call the script using a dash file bypass, um, but depending on your PowerShell execution, I assume that that could be a higher level. Um, so if it was all signed, you would just want to make sure like you code sign the script, for example. Okay, and then uh, the other two that are available at the product is you can add a custom command line. Maybe you want to add a product key or a custom parameter to customize the app update or install. You can do that. And then if it's an MSI based product, we'll have this option where you can add a transform file and we'll automatically apply that and add the switches for you. Okay. Next one we'll do is Java, so Java 8. We can see we have all our global options enabled that we configured. 
And uh, Java is a little bit fun, right? So we've got a what we call a patch my PC define script. What this will do is it will remove the old runtimes as a pre action uh, because by default, the JRE installer will not remove runtimes even within the same major version. So basically, this is just opted in by default. This is the only product that we do this for. Um, and if you wanted to optionally disable this, you can do that. But essentially, this will just ensure that you only have one version, the latest one, once this update is applied. OK, cool. So that's the two ones that we'll do as a software update. So once this syncs, we'll see these come into the all software updates uh, and show you what that looks like. Now, for the applications, there's only a few things that we need to do in the options menu. The first one is you need to tell us where your provider is. That's going to be how we can talk and create apps. So in our case, it's just the same server. And then we need a, a UNC path. So there's going to be the root folder where we download content. So within here, we're going to have a vendor folder, product folder, and then a unique ID for each app that we create within your environment. There's also a few like uh, properties that correspond to apps. So for example, do you want to allow the app to be in a cache sequence? So that's just a checkbox that would be auto enabled on the app that you'd probably be accustomed to. And then just a few other ones. Now, probably the biggest setting here is how do you want updates to the application to be handled? Okay, so by default, we update. So let's say that we created an app for Chrome 75. 76 came out the following week. How do you want to handle that? So we have two options here. Uh, we can update the app in place. So that means that we will download the latest MSI. Uh, we will um, essentially update the content source of your deployment type that we created for the app and then update your DPs. So the value there is if you're using a task sequence and you want to always deploy the latest versions of products, you don't have to go manually reassociate it when new updates come out. And then the second one is if you want more control, right? So if you want more control over when things happen, uh, you can choose to create a new app for each update. So you would have a, a Chrome 75 and a Chrome 76, and it would be a completely separate app in that scenario. Cool. Uh, and then lastly, we can automatically distribute your content. So you can add a DP group to automatically distribute it when we create these apps. <coughs> Cool. So I'm going to apply that, jump over to the sync schedule, and I'm going to trigger a sync. That's just going to get these updates and apps downloading in the background while we cover a few of these other tabs. Any questions, though, so far? Yeah. I answered this once before, but can you remind me how you prevent an application from updating past a major version? So yeah. Sometimes they charge you when you go from 17 to 18. Sure. Yeah. So the question was, how do we prevent <coughs> updates for major versions that are paid? Um, so, for example, TeamViewer. This one is a paid product. So if you enabled updates, we would only update you to the current major version that's installed. So within our detection, it would say, you know, we select a version 14. It would have to be greater than 14.0, but less than the latest. So that's how we would handle the detection to make sure that, that we don't do that. And if I had a mixed environment with some 13s and some 14s? Yeah, you would so just do both of them. Okay, you would enable both products. I see. And then if you wanted to go from 13 to 14, that's where you could use an application that gets created for 14 and deploy to your collections that had 13. So you could even do that, but it wouldn't be done automatically for you. You would have to deploy that to a collection if you wanted to do a major upgrade. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Hey, just, hey uh, so have you ever had anybody, like the client that I recommended for you, uh, you any way to do offline yeah, updates, offline. super updates? Yes, there are. Um, so. Yes. Um, so for offline, th th it's available today. Um, what do we call this? Air gap for user voice? Air gap, yeah. Same yes. Way. So yeah, so we can support air gap environments today um, for software updates. The way that it would work is you would install our publishing tool on a top level SUS, WSUS that has internet access. So probably the same way that you do it today, where you have to pull the Microsoft update catalog somewhere. So you're going to have some DMZ server that goes from Windows Update. Uh, you would essentially install our publishing service there. It would publish the updates, and then you would use WSUS Util export and import to pull the metadata, and then you would grab the WSUS content. Oh, same, same way. Yeah, just same exact way. Yep. So nothing changes from extracting Microsoft updates as compared to third parties since they all publish and live in WSUS. Um, th there's a few very specific scenarios for some DOD customers that like requested this user voice where they want a little different configuration that's a bit more 
complex. Um, so we may even do some stuff to make it easier um, for that scenario as well. Okay, but sync schedule. Um, so we can see that by default, we sync every day at 7 p.m. So we're generally doing about three to four catalog updates per week, just because third party patches don't correspond to Microsoft. Um, so generally we get updates out same day vendors release as well. If it's not a security update and we only have like one product per day, that's a scenario where we may just push that off to the next business day. But generally most updates go out the same day that vendors release, especially if it's security. Related. So this sync schedule is essentially how often you want to check our catalog and publish anything new. Um, so you can configure this however you want. So if you only want to check for new third party updates on a monthly basis or patch Tuesday, this is essentially the sync schedule for third party updates that you could configure within your software update point that would do Microsoft updates. So that's essentially what we're doing here. How yeah. often does Adobe release updates of Reader and Flash? Adobe's, Adobe is usually about once a month. Yeah. They often do it um, on Patch Tuesday. Because yeah, I, I had just gotten everything up to date and then like, and then, yeah, Pat, and, and then this, I started getting nags from the Flash again. I was like, yeah, oh. this last Patch Tuesday they released. Um, Chrome, Chrome is probably one of the ones that are pretty consistent on about once every week, sometimes two times a week. It's one of the okay. more frequent ones, yeah. Okay, uh, and then alerts. So uh, once you have your sync schedule, you can choose how you want to get alerted whenever anything new is published into your environment. So there's a few options you have here. We can enable SMTP emails. So anytime a sync runs, you would get an email showing all the updates that were published. And one of the new features that we've added are Teams webhooks. So for example, I don't know if you guys saw some of those notifications that were popping up in the taskbar, so, um, but we were getting Teams alerts right as we were publishing in real time. So for example, 3.41 p.m., we can see that a Java published. We can see it was a security update for the classification with the critical severity. We can also click out, directly go to the vendor release notes for that product that was just published into your environment. And if there's any CVEs, these are also clickable and we'll go to the National Vulnerability Database where you can get more details about the fix that was just published to your site real time via a Teams webhook. So pretty cool stuff. How do you tell it to how do you tell Teams? How do you tell it to talk to Teams? Yeah, so in the um, in the alerts tab you would create a Teams webhook within the channel you want to publish to. Mm -hmm. um, I can send you, there's a Microsoft doc, it's super okay. easy. Or I can Google, um, I can Google webhook. Yeah, cool. Yep. Webhook. Okay. yeah, so you just paste that in there. Um, and then if we did a test, for example, like we'll see that webhook get published in real time, just like the updates. Same thing for applications. So we'll see all the applications get created as well here. Um, cool. I mean, just, just curious why we're not seeing applications. Okay, so two updates were published. Oh, wow. So I completely skipped over the apps tab, I think. Um, cool. So we'll, we'll do this really quick again. Um, so for the application, same process. So you have all the same uh, products that you can select. And if you've enabled a bunch of products for software update publishing, we can even duplicate all of those to be enabled as an app. So for example, if we duplicate them, we can see that Chrome got enabled and it has all the same options that we have for the updates for Chrome as well. So disabling updates, shortcuts, post script to set the home page. All of those configurations can be applied within the app deployment that you're using within task sequences or collections too. Um, also, so what we're gonna do is go to 7-Zip. This is one that we're only enable as an app. And if we right click that, there are a few options here that are specific to applications, not updates, right? So a few things that just correspond to the app. So do you want to set the max runtime for that deployment type? So you can customize that via right click option. Uh, we can also add the deployment uh, process. So within the deployment type, you can add the process name so you can notify the users if they needed to close an app, if you want to deploy an update as an application. So you can have more interactive notifications if something needed to be closed. Another pretty cool feature that we can do on the app level is, uh, which actually I think I skipped over this. I'm missing all kinds of things today. Um, so back on the options, we can choose if we want to create all Patch My PC apps in a custom folder. So for example, in the apps, you can choose um, whether you want everything to go in like a standard subfolder. So we had a lot of customers. This was a really popular user voice uh, where customers wanted to have all their apps go into a specific folder. So we can do that at the options. Let's say we want to put everything in this Patch My PC folder. We can apply that globally. 
But then at the product level, let's say that you have a product that you want to go into a separate subfolder, for example. We now have the ability, this was also a recent user voice, we shipped this a few weeks ago. We could say we want 7-zip to go into this subfolder too. So if you want to be more flexible per product, you can move those right away. Okay, and then lastly, so this was also a user voice, but basically, let, let me just show you our roadmap. Um, pretty much everything that we do is all coming from our customer feedback from our user voice portal. So for example, if we look at our roadmap, so patchmypc.com forward slash roadmap, uh, we can see that everything that we ship essentially is tagged as a customer request. So basically this little yellow icon, that's all customer feedback. So for example, in the past couple months, you can see all these different features that we've been shipping based on customer feedback. Uh, the ones that are listed as purple are new products. So as customers request new products, we do add those to the roadmap too. So for example, we added eight products uh, in September, we added four um, the following month, and then five the next month. Um, so if you wanna kind of see what we're working on, you can track that using our roadmap. Um, so kind of while we're here, um, the next big thing that we're kind of looking at for this month and the next quarter is Intune. So um, it's still kind of early. Um, we've got some stuff that I might be able to show if we have time. Um, that's kind of the next big thing that, that we're looking to support. Okay, cool. So where the heck was I at? Um, okay, so custom. So yeah, so by default, we're going to create the app and we're going to have just the product name and then version, right? So that's going to change if you updated your apps in place. That's going to change every time there's an update. Um, so what we did, we gave you a right-click option where if you want to make that stay the same, so you don't want that to change, you can just come in, right-click, and choose what you want 7-Zip to be called, for example. Um, the reason that we added this is we had some customers that were using UI++ and UBI, where their applications were tied to a specific app name and the variables. Nice. So you can now make that stay static if you wanted to. Um, you can also do an icon. So that, that was a, another request. Um, where we, we generally use the vendor icon, but we had like some customers that wanted to put like something internal that they have for icons or something. So you can even customize the icons. Sometimes they're a little smearing. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. so generally, um, vast majority of ours are 512 by 512. Um, but if there was one where we couldn't find an official icon from the vendor source, we may be extracting it from like the EXE installer, for example. Mm -hmm. So there may be a small number of products where it may not be the best resolution in Software Center. So that could be another scenario where that right click could also have it where you could go download an own, own icon from the source. Um, so now that we've enabled the apps with the webhook, we can also see that we're getting notified in real time for the applications that just got created too. So same kind of thing here. We can see we had our Java app, our Chrome app. We also can go out to release notes for the apps as well. And those CVIDs for app creation are also clickable same national bond related database where you can get details about the apps as well as updates. Okay, so jumping over to Configman, I think that's really all I had to talk about from the service. Um, so the idea, once you configure the products that you want, the scanning that you want, whether or not you want to auto enable new products to get detected, um, really the idea of our tool is that you don't really use it, um, right? You just kind of set it, you enable the Teams alerts or the emails, so let me just jump over to the email really quick. Same concept with the email. So you can see what updates were published. The titles are also clickable and same CVEs. So once you've configured your products and kind of what, how often you want to trigger syncs, this just kind of lives in the background and you don't care about it. All your work would still be done through SCCM day to day. So the updates would flow into ConfigMan, the apps would just appear, and nothing would really be different than what you're accustomed to. Uh, with regards to this, so this would all be automated. Uh, any questions before we start showing you the console? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we've got our update. So the reason that we have our update showing up right away is within our sync schedule, there's a tab that said auto sync the sub whenever any new third party updates are published. So if our tool publishes a new third party app to WSTOS, we could then automatically trigger your software update point sync so you don't have to wait for your next scheduled sync if you wanted to see these new updates right away. So that's an optional checkbox that we had enabled. So that's why within you know a couple of seconds, we have the updates now showing up in the console and getting some data back. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, as far as deploying these, they're no different than what you'd be accustomed to. So for example, if you're creating your software update groups manually, maybe every month, you can do a search by vendor, classification, uh, same things that you'd be doing today. <laughs> now, since everything works just like any other Microsoft update, ADRs are gonna work the same exact way. So if you wanted to automate your software update group creation, we can see that we're just looking at non-superseded updates, critical security or an update classification where the vendors patch by PC. So if we were to preview this, we'll see those two updates that we enabled. Okay. So uh, when that ADR kicked off, we basically had three separate deployments. So we had two pilots and then a production. So you're gonna be using all your existing deployment methods. So collections, uh, deadlines, maintenance windows, reboots, software center being visible or not, all of that's exact same UI through SEC, nothing changes. So when that kicked off, downloaded our content into a deployment package, right? So we're gonna make use of all your existing DPs. So that's where your clients are gonna get it. You don't need anything new, as well as all the update groups. So we created our update group and our deployments on that client side. Uh, looking over at the applications, we can see that we now have the two apps for Chrome and Java at the root level. And then if we look at that subfolder, we can see the product that we moved there is 7-zip, and it's got our custom app name and being able to just break click option. If we go ahead and look at the app properties, we'll see all the metadata, right? So we're gonna include all your metadata that you'd be accustomed to. So things like the app name, documentation, privacy, icons, keywords, description that would show up for your users in Software Center if you deployed it. Um, so it looks really nice on the end user side. Okay, so before we jump to the client, I'm just going to run a quick PowerShell script. Here we go. And what that's going to do is just going to deploy those three apps to the all users collection as available, just so we can show you uh, what the software center experience is going to look like with the icons and description and keywords and stuff. Okay, so jumping over to the client. So this is a client that was part of our pilot group. So it had those software updates deployed um, kind of right away, right? So we can see that it is visible in Software Center because we had that option and the deadline is tomorrow. Um, so on this machine, just to show you what we have going on, uh, we've got an outdated version of Chrome and Java. So we have Java 70 or Chrome 75, Java 8 update 161. So just like any other software update, if you had it visible in Software Center, you could of course make it hidden, you could set your deadline however you want to do your update deployments. In our case, we made it visible. So for Chrome, go ahead and close that out. Um, we can see if we reopen that, we have just a standard Google Start page. So we we'll just search Google if somebody opened this. Um, if you remember though, we had a right click option on the app product that's gonna run the PowerShell script post update to set that home page. The other thing to note, we also have that public desktop shortcut. We also enable that right click option to delete the shortcut for Chrome within that update. So uh, go, going ahead and picking that off, what we're gonna notice here is um, we should see a folder get created here in a second. Yeah, it started by me. There we go. So that right click option that we enabled within the Chrome application to enable logging, that's gonna allow us to automatically add the logging parameter to Chrome's MSI and save it in the folder that you define, right? And in the event that it failed, that secondary log copy option for non-zero exit code would then copy this to a UNC path if you wanted to, as long as the computer had rights to uh, write a log file there. So we can see that Chrome's still running. Um, now, in addition to the vendor log, if you've enabled any of the custom right-click options like disabling updates, shortcuts, we will have a log file in the root of CCM called Patch My PC Script Runner. This also uses a CM trace format, and this will essentially show you all the customizations and installations taking place from our perspective. So for example, we can see that we ran the Chrome MSI. We automatically added the logging parameter based on the folder that you uh, defined in the right click option. We then give you the exit code of zero, so it was a good update. We then deleted the public desktop shortcut based on that custom action. Since we disabled self updates for Chrome, we set three different reg values to turn off the update feature of Google Chrome. And then lastly, we executed the custom PowerShell script that we defined to set the home page. And we returned the exit code of that as well. So we can now see if we go back to our desktop, the Chrome icon is completely gone. 
we go ahead and launch that from the start menu. The custom home page was configured using the PowerShell script that set that reg value. And then if we right click and go to settings, click about, we can see that Chrome updates were disabled globally based on that customization that we enabled. Um, so pretty cool as far as giving you custom options if you need it. Um, any questions on that before you look at Java? Cool. Uh, so for Java, same kind of thing here. So when we initially deployed their installer, we did not turn off self updates. So we can see we have that update tab showing up in their control panel. If we look at their Java update policy here, I think it's WoW 64 since we have 32 bit on here. Java saw Java update policy. So we can see just the default enable Java update is set to one. So we go ahead and kick that off. Now we also enable the option to close conflicting <coughs> processes for Java. So we're going to see the control panel app auto close. We're also going to see the update notification that was saying there's a Java update available auto close. Uh, within the same script runner log that we saw the Chrome update, we can see all that that took place for closing those processes as well. If you had the skip option here, if we detected the process was running, it would just skip the update and try during the next uh, software update deployment and evaluation cycle. So we can see there's that custom script that we were kind of talking about with Java that removes the existing runtime since their installer doesn't remove that uh, by default. So just to make sure that we're only left with the latest when we upgrade, we can now see that we're running the Java EXE install. And if we look back at the vendor logs, we can see even the EXE installers. So for Java, it's an EXE, not just MSIs. We have the verbose logging um, for that product since it supports the logging parameter as well. So if it ever fell, you can know exactly what happened. Okay, so that's the two updates. Uh, jumping over to the apps, we can see that we have all three of those apps that we deployed using that script. Looks, you know, nice and pretty. Uh, if we look at 7-Zip, we don't currently have that installed. <coughs> um, so if we look at add and remove programs, you can see that we don't have 7-Zip here. So just like any other app, um, we're gonna go ahead and launch that. It's going to use all the existing config manager. So you can see the download happen. You can see the install take place in app enforce.log. So we're making use of all the existing technology that you'd be accustomed to. Now, in addition to that, we're also going to see the app install take place in our same log too. So we can see that we ran the 7-zip exe installer with a forward slash s switch, and it got a good exit code, and we can now see that reported in software. Center. Right, so now if we refresh, we can see we now have 7-zip. And then we can now see that the Chrome and Java update were applied using a software update. Of course, for the apps, you could use these in task sequences as well. If you wanted to make sure you're always deploying the latest apps using the app feature. Cool, but that's it for client side. So we'll just jump over to check out some reports. Uh, any questions while we're, before we do that? Okay, awesome. So um, you're using the vendor's detection or are you writing custom? The detection for the updates? For every for application. Oh, applications. Okay, yeah. So th there's not really a vendor detection, if I you know. will, for apps. Um, so within our deployment type, um, yeah, we we use a script. Um, so there's the detection method. There's a few things that we do here. Um, so we're, we're using a PowerShell script. This does get code signed using your WSL cert too. So if you have all signed, it will be code signed so that it's trusted. Um, what we're essentially doing is we're we're matching the vendor's um, display name, and then we then we have two optional conditions after that. So the display name for this example would have to be um, Google Chrome, right? And then there's two additional things that could potentially make this match up. Uh, if it's an MSI, uh, it could be a product code that we detect in the uninstall key. And then in addition to that, it could also be a version. So either of those two would make this match as installed. Um, the reason we do the version is because it's a greater than or equals to condition. So what that means is like uh, uh, something that can come up quite often is if you use an MSI code for your app detection and then you're using a software update, Right, so it would update to a new code. So then it would cause like, if you were building this app and you just did MSI, you'd say, oh, I'm not installed anymore, but you actually have a new version. App Enforce would kick in, App Eval, and it could potentially bring you down, depending on how the app install handles the older version. So that's why we basically did two conditions. So if it's an MSI, if the MSI code's there, the app is installed. Um, if the MSI isn't there, we then do a greater than or equal to to check the versions that we know based on our data. Thank you. Sure. 
<coughs> any other questions? Cool. Um, so as far as reporting, um, the cool thing about that is uh, nothing changes, right? So uh, you can use native reports. So since our updates report just like anything else, anything under the native reports, software compliance, you can view. Um, we also have some SSRS dashboards. So native reports are not generally super helpful, like if you're talking about like presenting it to management, right? So there's no graphs. It's pretty basic. Um, so we have some SSRS dashboards. These are actually free regardless of whether you're a customer. So these were originally done by Gary Simmons as like a blog example of how to create reports in Big Man. What we did, we added support for new operating systems as well as an automated installer that would change all the links to match your server name and your site code. So it just makes the process a lot easier. So even if you're not using our product, feel free to go check these out. Um, so yeah, so we'll basically show you how many workstations, how many clients that you're managing, how many servers. Uh, we then break software update compliance by month for the last year for workstations and servers. So for example, for the month of December, we can see we have 316 instances of updates where it was either required or compliant. And out of that, we're 75% compliant, meaning 25% of those updates are required on machines and they haven't been installed. If we click into that month, we're going to sort by the number of updates missing on the most number of machines. So for example, if we do a quick look at our release history, this is an RSS feed that you can see all our releases. So we actually posted an update about an hour ago. I think there were about 25 third party updates today. So for example, we had this iTunes update that literally released like an hour ago, right? So publishing service kicked in, published the update, and we can see if we run our compliance report, where was I at? Over here, we can see that we already know that that iTunes update is missing on three machines and it's a security patch, right? So we had all those CVEs. We could click into that iTunes update. Depending on how deep you drill in, um, we may take you to a native SCCM report. So if you want to get very specific to say, what are those three machines? missing that iTunes update from your dashboard that you were drilling in to just get overall stuff, you can get very specific with what you want to see here, right? So these are the three machines that are missing that critical iTunes update that had CVs, for example. So pretty easy, right? Now, um, that's pretty much for the, that's good for the dashboards, I think. So there's just a variety of a couple. The ones that I showed would list Microsoft and third party. We have a third party only. You can also filter by SOGs or collections and do a little bit more custom if you want to. <coughs> now, let's say that you're using Power BI, right? So this is the free Power BI dashboard from Microsoft. Since everything reports the same way, you can use whatever solution you want. So it could be the Microsoft BI reports. You can use some of the free ones from SC Config Manager. Everything would be exactly what you'd be accustomed to. So for example, if we look over at the Update Compliance tab, we can see that in addition to all those Microsoft patches, we've got all these third-party updates missing too. We could do something like filter by critical severity levels, and we can see that we now quote off, and now we're missing Firefox and Java um, that have a critical severity level, right? Yeah. Does that only report on the things that you're patching on your catalog, or does it actually know about stuff that you're not even? Good question. Yeah, so the question was, is it only for updates in your catalog? So yeah, so it would be using the software updates reporting. So it would have to be updates that we published within the catalog. Yep. Cool. So that's most of what I did. Uh, one thing that you missed, Gary, I'm going to show you just for you, I'll show you this cool feature. <laughs> You're special. <laughs> so um, this is something that you missed. So even before you start publishing updates, it's kind of cool. You can come in and scan your Big Man database, look at the hardware inventory for installed apps, and we'll list how many counts we detected. And you can use this to enable all the products with like a click. So in a couple of seconds, enable everything that's detected. <laughs> We've got a database we can run against. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for, for you guys, you might want to use like an offline replica <laughs> database and just copy our settings file. Might be a bit much for that many clients. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's pretty much it as far as how we get it set up. So yeah, in about I think we're at about forty minutes now. So we went from just yeah. Uh, question on. Um, Microsoft guy asking, sure. um, uh, signing your application deployment. Do you have any functionality? Is, is it already doing that? Signing your application deployment. Yeah. Code signing. 
Yeah, so, I mean, with regards to updates, right, all the code signings done using the cert that you either import or the one that you generate through SCCM. As far as applications go, um, we code sign our PowerShell detection method script, right? But as far as the binaries themselves, right? So if we come in and we can look at the content source for Chrome, for example, like we're not going to sign their, the binaries, right? Because they're any 95% of vendors that are distributing software are going to code sign their installers, right? So if we come and look at Chrome, that's going to be code signed, right? So we're not going to sign. The, yeah, so I mean, we're not signing app binaries just because vendors will be doing that. Uh, we will sign the PowerShell detection method script with the code signing script that you've configured in WSOS so that if you're using a sign execution policy, the scripts will be trusted. So, for example, let me show you this just because I'm, I'm on all kinds of tangents today. Um, but we do, we do save the detection method script by default in the install directory. So, for example, for Chrome, we can see that we have signed the detection method PowerShell script with the code signing cert that you would have imported. So that could either be the self-signed one that SCCM created and already pushed to your clients, or if you use PKI, it would be the one that you import, for example, using a oh, using a PFX file. So for example, if you did want to use from, from a CA, you would simply get the cert that you exported and then it could code sign it even using an internal PCI that would already be trusted. So, yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, so, yep. Do you guys do any testing on any of these uh, contents at all internally? Uh, yeah. Good, or you just pull them straight no, from the yeah, good, good question. Yeah, I meant <laughs> yeah, to cover right. this. I'm, I mean, I'm missing all kinds of You can at least track things. the hashes of the binaries. No, we, we actually do a lot more than that. Um, so, this is actually something that we have up just because this question comes up a lot. Um, how do you validate integrity, right? So that's that's a big deal because these are coming from third-party vendors. There's a bunch of different um, things going on here. Um, so high level, we uh, we run every single binary through virus total. That gets posted in our release notes. So for example, we look back at that post today. Let's take a look at that iTunes, for example. Um, actually, let's look at one of the other ones. Let's look at this one. So we will include the virus total scans that we did against the installer's binaries. Um, and then from an integrity standpoint, so after we validate that the, the installer looks good, there's no like weird malware, bloatware, stuff like that. Um, I can find where my page was. Huh. So once we validated the integrity of the actual installer, <coughs> We then need to validate the integrity when it comes down from the vendor, right? So when it downloads from their site. So once we validate it's good, uh, it then saves a hash within our catalog. That catalog then gets timestamped with our code signing cert that would only be accepted from our publishing tool or even in the SCCM console if it's signed by us. Um, and then when we download the binary for the vendor's installer, the hash will be compared to make sure it's the same binary that we did the virus total scan. So that's high level, essentially what we're doing with integrity of the actual installers. For which one? Okay, yeah, yeah, so web, WebEx, yes. <laughs> so yeah, basically what happens is they, they often revert binaries for their MSIs like back and forth like almost daily. So what can happen there, it can basically cause a hash check where you would get a Teams alert or an email saying, hey, we didn't publish this update because the digest didn't match, right? So sometimes vendors that do a lot of changes and revert back to a previous version, sometimes that can cause hashes not to check out as yeah, what I think you were talking about. Yeah, at the end of the day, that's basically to help make sure that if that install was compromised from their vendor's download that we don't publish it. Do you guys remediate it? I mean, did that happen? Yeah, yeah, so we would release a new update. Um, so for Chrome, for example, they use the same binary for every update. So for example, it, it, usually it doesn't become a problem because most of our customers are syncing every night at 7 p.m. So they would have already had the new update published. 
Um, but for example, let's say you were syncing once a week and Chrome like just released an update, you know, you may get a hash check because the version was newer. In that case, just when we released the catalog update that day, it would then just fix itself and it would get the latest one with the right hash. Um, but yeah, it's pretty rare that that happens when you're using our publishing tool. It's actually more common if you're using the in console publishing of SCCM because by default, which there have been some improvements in 1910, <coughs> it would only sync once a week. So it was more common where you may be out of date with what the update was that was published for the hash. Cool, uh, so pricing, I'll cover that and we can do any other questions. Um, so let me just quickly go over what we have going on with that. Um, so it's a uh, subscription per year. So we have three different options. We have a basic enterprise <coughs> and enterprise plus is what we call it. Um, basic is a very manual process using Scott not many customers use that. So generally it's gonna be enterprise or enterprise plus. If we look at the comparison chart, really the only difference between those two are going to be the app creation feature. So if you only care about updates, you could do enterprise at $2 per device a year. If you want the app fees, which at least since we released it in the past four or five months, obviously it's for most environments it makes sense for a dollar extra client to reduce all that packaging headache. Um, so that's basically the subscriptions that we have. Um, for the pricing point. Um, outside of that, if you want to get a live demo, which is basically what we did here, like with your team, you want to bring more people in before potentially getting pricing or something. We've got this interactive calendar. You can come in and schedule a demo if you want to bring managers or other teammates, for example. Um, and then outside of that, if you want to get a pricing quote, you can just do that all from the website. Um, outside of that, that's pretty much all I had today. So any other questions we can we can take. Do you have anything on YouTube? Is anyone commenting or is it still streaming? Uh, somebody asked about the Power BI report, but I think it's just the standard can one. Oh, I want to know more about the Power BI report. Sure, too. yeah, so Power BI report. I thought maybe I was zoning out when you talked about how- Yeah, basically, um, here we go. So this is Power BI. I'm in, going to include it in the Teams room. If you want to paste that on YouTube, Nathan, that's where they can go download that. It's already on YouTube as well. And then cool. I'll send out a, a recap at the end of this meeting as well, probably Thanks. tomorrow, Saturday notes uh, on the Meebug website. So, so we have to get it from you and put it somewhere, but then it'll just work. Yep, no, yeah, it's just, you could probably even like search it. Basically Power BI, SC Config Manager dashboard. They basically have the installer up on GitHub. Okay. You would just download this EXE oh, okay. and kind of walk through it. Okay. Cool, other questions? Yeah. Can you go into more detail on about your Intune rollout? Oh. <laughs> How much time do we have? You guys need to get back up here soon. Um, I'll, I'll basically kind of show conceptually what we're thinking. Um, let me think what I want to tell you. <laughs> so what what we're essentially thinking, and this, this could change. So on our user voice, we, we've marked it as started now because we've got some code looking good, that doesn't mean that we may still not hit blockers where we couldn't ship. So just keep that in mind. But we do have some stuff working today. That's a good first start of what we're thinking. Um, so there's not any native patching for third party updates that's going to be available. On Intune. Um, the reason for that is because if you're using standalone Intune, you're going directly up out to Microsoft updates. So they're not going to allow <laughs> vendors to go and publish to a catalog that serves clients on the internet, right? So um, what we're going to do, assuming we don't hit any blockers, so we've got to, we've got, so we're gonna basically be like app management, right? So we're gonna, our idea is we're gonna create Win32 apps for you, um, which could potentially be used for patching, right? So at the end of the day, whether it's an update or an app, it's probably using the same installer. It's probably an MSI, EXE, or MSP, that can essentially go through as an app. So the idea is that we're gonna help alleviate all, it's kind of like the apps feature for SCCM, right? So um, our idea is that we're gonna create all those apps for you. And then you can determine based on your app deployment, how you wanna patch, right? So you could then assign it to either a group based on, which we haven't even looked, started looking at groups like yet in Intune. I don't know if you can like make it dynamic based on apps yet or not, um, but you could just choose how you wanna deploy that app. Um, based on inventory or something like yeah. that. What was that? So you start leveraging the graph. So I work yeah. in, into space a lot. Yeah, so that's what we're using. We're, we're doing everything through graph. 
And when I say if we hit a roadblock, or that's really what I mean. Like if there's something that we just can't do to provide a good solution using RAF, that's really where it could be a roadblocker. But so far, things are looking pretty good for what we're testing. Um, but let me see if I can show you the client side here. Um, and I won't be too much longer just because I know you guys have a second part here. While we're waiting for this to pull up, any questions while we're looking at this? The applications, can you just have it overwrite each time? So each time, like, Chrome is released, you just overwrite the last application? Gary, why were you late? We, we've sorry. talked all about this. We've talked all about this. Um, yes, yeah, so just, just because I like you. We're going to go show you how, what that is. So there's two options. Um, you can either choose to update the app in place where you wouldn't have to go reassociate sequences or anything, but just update DP's content. Or if you want more change control, you can choose to create a new app each time. Okay. One thing we're going to start looking at it into at some point soon after we can get like some testing around scale is potentially using supersedence native to apps. Um, so that might be something we do in the future as well. Um, but today, basically, you can update in place, or you can create a new app if you want more version control. Love it. Cool. Let me see if this is up. Yeah, so basically at the end of the day, it's going to be like an app catalog type deal where you don't have to go manually do the whole Win32 packaging into an Intune Win. Is, and it looks like looks like our devs are making some uh, good progress already. Should I try this? <laughs> this, this, could, this could fail. Um, while we're waiting for that, just to, I'm, I'm expecting it to fail, but we'll see. Um, while I'm waiting for that, any other final questions before Mike and Gary come up, finish it up? I have a question just about me. Are you hanging around? Uh, yeah, I'll be around. Anything else? Yeah. I just want to share my experiences with installing this in my environment. I have a PKI environment on my big manager environment, so I'm sure everybody has that when you're trying to do the CMG. So I didn't really put my uh, certificates on the WSUS server, the sub server. And so I had a hard, heck of a hard time trying to get this thing to work with all my clients. So there's some sort of weird, I think Justin, you posted on your blog that you have some sort of um, um, ways how to issue certificates to uh, either do the self generation, uh, self generating certificate on the client or importing one from the CA. But if you have an environment where you issue certificates to your workstations and you're using this, uh, that as a PKI for your CMG, you need to issue uh, a web server certificate to your WSS as well in order to authenticate that traffic. And then you can use the, the self-signing certificate. Um, <coughs> okay, cool. It took me a long time to figure that out, but it was, uh, it was a pain in the butt. Good to know. So. Well, we installed an app. I just don't think our detection scripts are quite ready. Um, <laughs> yeah, it did install. It just doesn't think it installed. Um, cool. Are we good? Any uh, anything else? Cool. Thanks, everyone. I'll give it back to Mike and Gary. So, uh, for software titles, uh, we often get the question. Um, well, how, how come you guys, and what made me think of it was Justin's uh, presentation, uh, how come you guys don't just do greater than or equal to? And it's really simple for us because A, uh, we run a really controlled environment, and just because it's greater than doesn't mean it's gone through our testing and certification process. Um, so <coughs> there's you know, a little chance that, that a newer version would get introduced to our environment, but we want to make sure that we're kind of in full control. So for versions, being a controlled environment, we should only have one version that we test and certify. Well, we, we do make exceptions. We'll have two versions once in a while, um, but that's what we do. And, and people say, well, just do greater than or equal to. And it's like, no, no we don't. That's still an unknown to us. It still introduces a potential failure point, which which we're trying to eliminate. So, 
What are you looking at, Gary? I was going to show them how we are able to leverage uh, a baseline and you know, baseline data during a test sequence. And here we go. All right, so all that information you saw earlier uh, on the client side, it's all saved in WMI. So that's how during a test sequence, uh, what we're doing is we're reaching into WMI, doing a query where we're grabbing a desired configuration, where it's, it's like pre-assessment. From there, then we can start grabbing the different parts of it, um, and we can determine whether it is compliant or not compliant. And we can actually also trigger the compliance uh, evaluation as well. So what we end up doing is uh, finding out whether it's compliant or not compliant. If it's not compliant, then it's going to say not compliant in the, in the WI. And then what we do is we actually trigger uh, the compliant um, the compliance item on baseline on the client. So we have one more chance for it to double check. If it's if it's already set to compliant and the last compliant date is within 24 hours, we just assume it's good and we move on with the upgrade. If it's not compliant, what we do is we actually trigger another baseline evaluation and we wait for that baseline evaluation to come back. And then at that point, once the evaluation has come back, we then grab those results and continue on with that. So in the logic, it's if, if the difference in hours is 24 hours, or if it's not compliant, trigger an eval, go ahead and wait. So it checks, the, it grabs the original evaluation time, and then it waits 10 seconds and checks the evaluation time. Is it the same? Well, wait another 10 seconds and wait until the, the evaluation time is now a different time, because then we know it's updated the evaluation. And then it checks to see, oh, is it compliant now? If it's compliant, then I know that this machine's ready for upgrade. If it's still not compliant, pop up a box saying that you're not compliant and why you're not compliant. So that's how we're able to leverage it. And I'm hoping to demo that. So there's a, a little bit of, so we, we kind of killed two birds with one stone here also because since they are based on the same pre-assessment rules. Um, there's a slight chance that a device has gone non-compliant between the time that it passed pre-assessment, sat and ready for scheduling and then got scheduled. So that's why we run, we do a, a pre-flight check, which is basically the same set of tests. Um, we do we do a couple other pre-flight checks too, uh, which we call execution checks, and that would be like, is it on uh, AC, uh, battery? Um, we had one in there for uh, what was it? Our fail-safe. Uh, oh, your kill switch. Kill switch. Yeah. So if there was an issue and we needed to send a kill switch out, uh, we could do it to prevent machines from upgrading that kind of thing. Never had to use it. Yeah. Would. Um, but it, now we could just do a simple CI, actually. We could create a CCI that does a kill switch and wouldn't even have to touch the clients. It would fail that check and then right. go. So this is the script from our OSI install. It finished. Um, so basically, it also shows you that it's removing the registry values for OS uninstall from uh, where I have a temp location so it knows where to go. And then it finishes the script. Um, it resets a task sequence, and as you can see, when I, I, I should have pointed it out, um, it showed the task sequences and that they were available. It didn't say that they were running, it didn't say that they were failed. It looked like they had never run because we delete the execution history for that task sequence as well. So it looks like it's actually a machine that's never upgraded. Uh, actually, one thing to point out here too, this is more actually Gary Town magic, is we wanted a new user experience. Um, this is probably something we don't talk about enough. Um, but there's a task sequence running behind here, and it's actually pulling all the information from the task sequence engine on each of the, you can see each of the steps of the task sequence. So we've we've gone from less cryptic names of our steps and stuff to more user-friendly names so that they actually make heads or tails of what we're trying to say. But we wanted it to look like 
what they see at home if they have a Windows machine at home. Because it's like, why do they want to see a completely different experience at work? You know, it's going to be, they're going to be like, eh, what's this? Plus, I think the OSD uh, UI needs a little bit of an overhaul, a little bit of a modernization. Um, so that's where this comes from. Were team member and service desk customizable? This whole thing is customizable. I mean, like, I was wondering if you do it on the fly. Like, yes. hi, Gary, we're updating your computer. Um, you have you trouble, can pull email Gary. If you, <laughs> if you want to put, if Gary that down. data is available somewhere, you can pull it. Oh. Um, if you can, so what is, what this is actually grabbing are task sequence variables. Ah, nice. um, so if you have a way to grab those task sequence variables, you could easily manipulate this. Well, you'll write that next week for us, right? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Is it next week? Do you have a user voice board? No. Uh, <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> okay, come on. So where did this tool come from? I, I missed. Oh, so this is just a this is just PowerShell, um, and I got the idea from SMS Agent, and I took his. I mean, that's what the community does, right? We just find something that somebody else did and we modify it and make it our own. Dealing with pride. That's right. <laughs> uh, so his didn't have like the progress for like the, uh, his was basically just that screen where it then it showed the rotating big text. I added the step and I added, uh, when you hit the Windows upgrade, I added the section that uh, shows you the percent of the upgrade. But uh, come on, where's my folder? Sometimes they just grab things and don't realize what it is and take time. Okay. It's all important stuff. Okay, so on this step, it's running the actual pre-flight checks. So what it's doing there is it's running the CI or the baseline, and because it was non-compliant, it's rerunning the the baseline. So this step could take a little bit longer than uh, most. If it was already compliant, this step would be like a second. But because it was non-compliant, it takes a little bit longer because it's waiting to check the compliance again. Because we don't want to fail if we don't have to. So we use as uh, nested task sequences. All right, so a couple so, hands. So uh, we have. Oh, okay. Yeah. This line never actually displays. Yeah, yeah th that's a, a feature of the PowerShell WPF part. Yeah. But uh, so basically, the, I could quick add essay. So the, the PowerShell script that's running. It, it combs through all your test sequence variables and grabs anything that starts with SA underscore and then populates that into an array and then it loops through that. So if you want to add or change, you just come into the test sequence and change it. So there's no content change. Now this was created before the beautiful built-in run script so you could actually paste the whole script in. So we tried to find as many clever ways as we could to modify things without changing content because changing content requires way more work than just a quick modification of a test sequence. Um, but then we also have several scenarios on the side. So like even the color scheme, the blue, it's all variables. So if you wanted to change it to red, you could easily change it. Um, so you all know that, you know, hashtag 01A47 is like blue, right? Sure. <laughs> Whereas, um, okay, that's a oh, warning. Whereas the you know eight D one three one three is red, so all you have to do is change these things, the variables, 
uh, manipulate the entire process so that way you can use the exact same scripts to use it in totally different ways. You said it cycles through and grabs those variables. Is that anywhere they are? Well, it. so when you... Like you had put them in there, but if I wanted to put them, sprinkle them throughout my task sequence so that it actually was telling them what it was doing. You would have to relaunch the WPF form so that it would then recycle and grab whatever's available. Because basically what it's done is anything in the task sequence at that time, it's going to okay. grab it and run. Oh. So where are you launching the WPF form in the first place? Oh, is that you just want to know everything? Well, I <laughs> want to be cool like that. Yeah. Okay. So I like what you did. Really I want to know how you did it. <laughs> yeah. You guys use yeah. that in production, that splash screen, or just absolutely? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we want to make it as user friendly as as absolutely possible. Everybody left into the last client I ever did. Because we put dad jokes all over. <laughs> so, so Mike and Gary, where are you guys finding some of this stuff? I work at Microsoft, and there is no documents that have this in it. So we make where, it, huh? We make it. <laughs> it's it's an idea that spawns an idea that spawns another idea, and it's like, hey, maybe we can do this, right? And so we look, go search, we bing it, right? Where did you find uh, the color information? Oh, that's just the quote Google, like, give me a color palette. They've got to be just, aren't they? Just yeah. 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 Make my own flavor of it, or whatever. Go from that. So. Yeah. So basically, we start the task sequence. We grab our variables that we, you know, the initialized variables is like uh, your uh, shutdown command, stuff like that. Some of the basics. Uh, we also put 1809, like what build we're going to. Um, we back up the SMSTS log so that way we can make troubleshooting really easy. So that way, when your task sequence is done, when you look at the SMSTS log, it's only from that run. It's not from all the other 18. So we take the current SMSTS log, uh, pen the current timestamp to it, so that way when the test sequence is done and it commits it, it's only committing that one run. And then the launch splash clean, and then everything comes after that. And then it's like we're recording our start time, the user logs in, uh, uh, the inventory data is all sorts of goodies that we're stamping to the registry. Um, Let's see how that demo box has come along. Yeah, it worked. Okay. Uh, so it cuts out to this screen. So a pre-flight error and the config manager client mismatch. So on this machine, I've got a level of the config manager client that has not been approved yet. I'm actually running 19.10. And the last time I've gone into the CI to approve a, a config manager client was 19.06. So because this has a non-supported tested uh, client, it errors out. So then I can just go into CI, add that string in, and it would then populate on here. I'm sorry, it would allow it the next time you're upgraded. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. CIs worked for both things. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's a good question. Yeah, CIs. Do you guys have any version control issues with code? Like, you guys integrate Git or anything like that to make sure it stays clean, or is it all manual for now? Right now, it's all manual. Eventually, we'll get that far, but for now, just for our own, yeah. it's easier for us to control our own stuff and not have to. We have a lot of silos where we're at, and we don't own that. So, right now, we just what we own. Right. We should probably go back to the presentation. Okay. Back to this one here. All right. I'm going to jump back to OS uninstall really quickly. So we're going to quiz you on it now that you had pizza and then listen to Justin and whatnot. No. So um, just this is going to be more of a summary, really. Um, the ability to revert back has been in Windows 10 since Windows 10 came out, before Windows 10 came out. Um, like I said, automation was possible starting in 1803 with the DISM command. 
Um, and it's not the same as rollback. I got corrected by uh, one of the Microsoft engineers that uh, there's two distinct things. They use the same underlying mechanisms, but it's not the same as rollback. Rollback's what happens when you're upgrading and it fails and then it goes back. Um, actually had that happen to me. I had a like a Samsung tablet that I <laughs> run the Insider builds on, been using that for years. Took it to a user group meeting that we were hosting and uh, forgot my adapter. That's kind of a reoccurring theme, I guess. Um, and a new Insider build came out. So I'm like, get, go. <laughs> and it starts going and then battery died. So I get home, I'm like, well, I'm probably gonna have to reload this thing, right? Plug it in, power it up, and it successfully rolled back to the previous build. And from that point on, I was like sold on the technology. In fact, um, Suma, she's one of the, uh, I think she's an engineer at PM at Microsoft on the Windows team. When I was in a meeting with them, I made a mention to it that that's like one of my favorite features. And she didn't quite know how to react. And uh, she did it in a session at night this year. And she actually said that. She's like, yeah, somebody once said that uh, that was one of the best features we we built, right? And she's like, I didn't know how to take that. But that was me that said that. And uh, now I strongly believe that it just is a testament to how robust that process works. Um, so, Mike, you're saying rollback is applicable to the servicing upgrade and then uninstall is applicable to the media version of upgrading? Or no, it's um, – so rollback is what would happen in servicing more media-based. Um, OS uninstall is – I've successfully upgraded, but I found out the app XYZ or device doesn't work and I want to go back. So it has to be done and then you go back. Yeah, and there's only a finite window. And we set ours to two weeks um, just to give them 10 business days or hopefully 10 business days without holidays in between um, because you might not use an app every day um, and if you haven't used an app within 10 business days it's probably not a business critical app hopefully it's not but end of month reports. you never know what was the question end of month reports end of month yeah Quarter reports. yeah i guess so um okay. Oh yeah, you can step through that. So, with the OS on install, as Mike was alluding to, we found all those issues, and the same thing with rollback. Um, that if even though the, the computer was in a usable state, it was completely unmanaged, which is why then we had to develop all these uh, scripts and um, knickknacks to make sure that uh, after it was done, you could actually re uh, it would be managed, so that it would start getting updates again, and it would repopulate in the console and actually push hardware inventory and everything. Um, on its own, if you do a rollback, I mean, you, you might not know about it because you know, last time you'll see the point has started and then it's just gone. And until the client gets healed by some magical force. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's why we've done a ton of testing around this process. Uh, during when we were developing the, the scripts to self-remediate, I would go through, just uh, like with Windows, there's five phases. I'd go through and power down for every single phase just to make sure that all the automation behind the scenes would eventually get the machine back into a working state. So if the user could go through their job and now uh, you could try again and like, without having to have a service that's call. We did run into two caveats for this process. Number one was machine account passwords guys know that the machines change their password every 30 days by default unless you change that setting in your active directory so what happens if i upgrade new version and i'm about to change the password and then i go to revert back domain trust issues right so i couldn't quite remember the command line because uh, i'm getting old so I ping my good friend Michael Niehaus and I said, hey, what's that command line you can run to trigger a machine account password change? And that, he's like a encyclopedia three times over and he gave it to me. And uh, and so we plugged that in. So right before we get ready to upgrade, we change the password because we know that we're going to have 30 days, which is in our 14 day window to uh, revert back to the previous build. Um, so that's it. NL test. Yeah, Gary already blogged it. Uh, 
SC change password and <coughs> uh, the domain that it's a part of. So that's what we have in there uh, to do that. The other issue we found out was uh, OS uninstall doesn't like working if a new user profile has been created. <coughs> so because it doesn't know what to do with that profile, and since it's user data, it doesn't want to, it's not going to be there in the old OS. It has no way of backporting it to the old OS. Um, so yeah, we ran through this when we were testing, and uh, then Gary did some magic that we're we actually prompt. I think it's in one of the videos that he posted on yeah. YouTube. Um, it'll prompt the end user saying, hey, this account has a new profile that's not part of this. Do you want to go ahead and delete it? So typically, normal users can't delete it, but since it's running under the system context, if they say yes, then it's gone. Typically, it's an admin that's logged on. Oh, wait, you had an issue? Hang on, let me log on with my credentials and see if I can get that card scanner working or this or that. Well, yeah, now it's not going to be able to go back until you delete that profile, which is probably not necessary on the machine anyway. So, so we've engineered around that as well to have a what I think is a pretty cool for the process. Yep. So, you guys are good until like nine or something? <laughs> <laughs> what would it take for you guys to start to use servicing? What would it versus take? Versus test sequences. So uh, you missed out. It would, it would take a lot of vendors fixing their application. <laughs> yeah, that's number one. Number two is, so, and, and not to kind of bag on servicing, because there are pros and cons that we kind of talked about at the, at the beginning, but you can do pre and post actions now yeah. in Windows, which is great. And the way I said this to, to, to the Windows team that came out um, to our AZ Smug location was, I have a sister team full of PowerShell MVPs. I don't know how many people in that room had a team full of PowerShell MVPs. So for what somebody, like that can bang out a script to do something relatively quickly. But for everybody in here who's ever touched the task sequence, is familiar with the task sequence engine, and they can pretty much drop a step in in two, two, two seconds, right? Yeah. That's that's the first point. Second point is, is there's no reporting and visibility around pre and post scripts. I have no reporting framework. I send it out to a branch. And do I wait until the next day when they don't work because something didn't go right? I can't get that information back. With CM, every single step is going to send a status message back. It's going to be fully logged in the logs as well. And so we've, we've got that. Um, so that's really two pieces. And then, like Gary said, apps, we didn't even get into our issues. I think that's later down. But apps have been a thorn in our side. Just they, they don't survive in place upgrade. They're written poorly. A lot of them use active setup, which is not kosher with Microsoft. Um, they do some other things. Their teams don't test. They think testing is, oh, hey, Windows 1909 just came out. Let me load it up and load my app and test it and call it good. And it's like, you know, you need to load up 1909, install your app, upgrade it, and then also test it and see if it's still good. But ISVs, they have no clue. This is me. Yeah. Driver management. Okay, we talked about drivers a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep in this, except we're working on stuff. So those of you on Twitter, yeah, we might have alluded to some stuff that we're working on because we got challenges, mainly network uh, challenges, number of devices, things like that. Um, but we do have current support for about 45 models in our environment. And we like to be as transparent as, as possible. Um, so the data that we sucked in, we used to track it manually in a Confluence page. It carries like, let's just use these available fields in CM and write a report. And that's what this is here. Um, <clears throat> We do a pre-production driver and a production driver per model, so that way we can test drivers before we update them. Um, there's some several good community tools out there as well. Uh, SD Config Manager probably has the, the best one. Um, 
where they'll go, you put what models in there, and it'll create new driver packages for you and things like that. Um, we're doing things a little bit differently, we're actually keeping the same package ID. And so by drivers, when we talk about driver packages, we don't suck these in in the traditional driver packages in CM as you would know it, right? Um, kind of gotten away from that a few years ago. And these are just standard legacy packages. Um, a, uh, we don't want to blow our database any more than it already is. We've got a big database. Um, B, it just gets kind of messy. Um, and C, you don't have as much flexibility with driver packages as I do with standard packages. So, so that's kind of how we do it. Um, and like I said, we're looking at doing some more innovative stuff around this. Hopefully, MMS 2020 timeframe. Uh, we'll maybe put this session together and do that. So. Yeah, so the report, once again, was just because we're trying to be completely transparent. And all these fields are pulled directly out of the package information. Um, so that means we had to populate all this information on the package. But uh, I've written a script that will go out and actually create all this information. It actually uh, looks at Dell and HP and populates a lot of the information directly from them. And it's transparency for other teams, too, because if they say, oh, Gary and Mike are off doing their own thing again, whatever. And it's like, nope, we get the drivers from our other team that does the drivers. We just want them in a specific format that, that we can use. And that format will actually be used for not just in place upgrade, uh, but we have plans to use it in uh, bare metal and uh, existing machines that are already deployed that we need to upgrade the driver's stack on those two. So, demo time. No one was going to demo. You were going to demo. <coughs> So part of uh, having, we have a lot of retail locations and uh, most of them have uh, very, very small pipes. Um, so we saturate them, we get yelled at. So we try to be very um, uh, aware of the content that we're pushing across the wire. And wherever possible, we try to get efficiencies through uh, deduplication and uh, coming up with uh, lead bath, lead branch cap just to uh, reduce the strain on the land. Mike's going to do a quick little demo showing that um, the efficiencies that can be gained by having content already out there and then pushing out uh, additional content. This is, do you have two builds of this? Yeah, one's, uh, so this is 1909 and the ISO is 1809. Oh, I just wanted to extract that ISO. Oh, I didn't need to extract it. That's what's cool. Oh, no, I have. Yeah, I can check. Fresh, fresh, fresh. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so who, who uses branch cache? Anybody? Just a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I think it's like, uh, like free. Well, it's free. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's one of Microsoft's mo mo most least understood technologies um, because it is very complex. Um, but you don't need to know everything about it to actually use it. Um, who's familiar with uh, data deduplication on servers? Most of you? So they're both based off of the same technology. Um, and what data deduplication is, for those of you that might not know, is it takes a file and it kind of puts it up in the slices. You can think of like, you know, we use Legos a lot or carrot slices or whatever, but it will group like green Lego pieces with this and that. And so you can have a file that has the same file blocks, uh, several <coughs> different files that share that same file block and it gets stored one time on the disk. Um, so, I'm not good at typing, I usually have this pre prepared. Yeah. Okay, so they introduced this little tool called DDP eval. Um, for calculating what your savings are going to be. 
and we use this also for calculating what branch cache savings can be as well. So if we run this, um, and it can't be on a, a volume that's already has dedupe enabled, so I had Gary add another drive to his virtual server here. So in the folder that he's running against, it has uh, it has an 1809 ISO directly downloaded from um, Microsoft, and then it has a 1909 extracted, uh, updated uh, install media. So now we're going to go and uh, basically if the PDU was enabled, we'll see how much we could save even though they're completely different. So the beauty of this is, if you're thinking about this now, we've deployed 1809, all the content is out there. Now we're going to come around and deploy 1909, where we left the 1809 content out there, and in a second, on the server, uh, you'll see that basically because we already have content out there, even though it's not even the same content, it's a totally different version of Windows, we're going to have a decent savings of two gigs that we don't have to actually send across the wire. Yeah. <clears throat> Might uh, explain more of the fun parts, but basically because the content's out there and because of the way that DDoF works, it's the block size or the block level, um, we can get efficiencies in that manner. Uh, versus like, it doesn't mean like the packages themselves sometimes like between v1 and v2 of the package they'll get a delta they can be completely different packages completely different content and you're still going to get uh, big uh, deduplication on those because of the fact that they share so many blocks and we've seen huge efficiencies on like driver packages between different models even just because uh, different models share like 50 percent of the same content or block level so even though we have like a HP and even a Dell kind of sitting next to each other, they still share a lot of the same block double data. So they will actually grab like 80% of that content from the peer before it has to go back out to the DB to the rest of the Dell. Yeah, so you can see we can kind of correlate space savings to network savings also. So I tried to zoom in a little bit, um, but you can see that there's um, 2.1 <laughs> space savings. So we're getting a uh, 22 percent um, basically efficiency there which that's two that's a year apart in windows builds um, I recently did the same thing Let's see if talking about driver packages a second ago and that's probably like the second largest piece of content on your network I mean AutoCAD aside uh, but in your OSD content right so we're talking about doing a few things um, and number one was I took two different HP uh, driver packages for the same model and extracted them and then I wanted to zip them. And I tested multiple different zip compressions. So if you zip stuff with a super aggressive compression algorithm, uh, it doesn't dedupe very well. So if you looked at software updates, um, they use a very aggressive algorithm and they don't dedupe well. Um, so I tested like fast, fastest, optimal, um, just windows, like right clicking in the GUI and came up with a bunch of different results here. Um, but what we can see from this, even a zip file, we were getting um, about 81.79% efficiency. So um, you can see in this particular one. And that's on the on a client machine? <coughs> yep. Okay. Yep. How are you deduping a client machine? Well, BranchCast uses VDU. Okay. So Good. the client's just instructed, hey, go get this content. It goes to get the content. And says, uh, Vince says, well, I'm going to use BranchCast. BranchCast is going to be like, hey, does anybody have this content? Um, so this is what I call a, a single dimensional test. One client, no other clients on that network, right? So I sent the first package down, it fully cached it. And uh, if we scrolled up, we would see very little uh, dedupe efficiency. Although the zip file actually, I think it deduped like 20 meg. And then when I sent the version two of the driver package down, zipped, 
we see that we only got 113.64 meg from the server. So those slow link people that raise their hand right in this area, instead of sending, you know, the full lot, I only had to send 113 meg the second go around. Now, as you get more cash is populated on that network, your efficiency is going to go up. Some of the benefits of this, and I kind of mentioned this in the blog here, is this has advantages over other technologies uh, like CM Peer Cache because those work at a package ID level. Mesh Cache can care less about a package ID. It doesn't even know what a package ID is. It's looking for the little file chunks. So, so do you ever have applications where like you're pushing it out every month, but all you change is like the wrapper script just slightly? Well, that's all you're pulling down is just that couple K instead of the full thing because everything else is already in the branch cache. Yeah, so you got Office and you have two deployment types in Office because of a language pack or this or that. You can have two clients side by side with their different content ideas. They will never share uh, using the, the other technologies. Branch cache can care less. Let's look at the file box. It's going to get 99.99% from the beer in that particular case. Um, so there's definitely some some big advantages of this. So this is just some of the stuff that we're actually starting to uh, look at for our WAS 1909 next year of shifting some of our workloads so that we can become more efficient and not send as much content because we're pretty big users of the network and uh, we want to kind of fly under the radar because uh, we don't like, you know, always getting called. Do you know how Branchish like hashes each block? Like how it knows, because like obviously the file, like how does it know like all the, the, the blocks to actually get that in a secure way? The blocks, yeah, so you know uh, <laughs> go to the Tupine guys webpage and they've done some extensive deep, deep dives on like, <coughs> Uh, they have a little tool called Hashy Bashy out there that shows how those are generated. But if you do have BDU running on the server side, then it uses the same uh, file hashes. So those get pre-populated and then the clients can go ahead and use them versus it initiating it, the server having to generate them, the client waiting, and then it might not use branch cache in that particular case, like for the first ones out of the gate kind of thing. But uh, yeah, that's, but it's all secure and it's, it's probably a technology that not many people at Microsoft even understand. We're at the, the cutoff point. Yeah, so I think uh, we're going to at least do the drawing because I know we said this ran until five tonight. Uh, so we'll get, get everybody's uh, ticket in the giant red bucket here. Justin wants to talk. And then just extra, just if you have an extra sheet hanging around. There should be a stack of them. I have a stack of them right there. Here's sheet. Anybody else Here, I'll take it up to them. Are they not going to bring it up at all? Oh, yeah, it's on. Yeah, they put my work in. Walk me through this. Fill out one. Extra one. Right there. These are sophisticated raffle tickets. I had my own. These are sophisticated raffle tickets. So I just started off now because I have an alternative. You started with this already. Big bucket. Bring that just for the raffle? Uh, I'd rather bring all my equipment. For this. <laughs> Last call for tickets. All right, Gary, should you do the honors here? He's like, Gary Mock, James, Fuller. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Uh, In the avalanche jersey shirt polo there. We'll see us at the end. He'll get you all set up. Yeah, and I'm excited to see you at uh, NMS this year. All right. Um, I'm not going to hold anybody back because I also need to get to the airport soon. But I just wanted to touch on this slide. Did this here image, the middle part with the fancy, the nice, the nice part of it, was provided uh, on the Microsoft troubleshooting page. 
mm-hmm. on their docks. Their docks are actually pretty <coughs> uh, and, and this is assuming like regular, like you double click setup and you let it go or you use servicing. So then I, what I did for our tech staff was just like explain how CM fits into this. Um, so the down level phase, so there's four phases, technically five if you consider complete success uh, a phase. Um, so downloading like the driver updates, and OS updates, all the dynamic stuff, that's like if you check that box in the task sequence that allows it. We slip this in using uh, OS Builder, so we don't check that box because we also don't have the bandwidth and build our networks. But if you can check the box because you have amazing amounts of net, uh, bandwidth, just do it. Because then your language packs come back down, your uh, features on demand come back down, and you don't have to figure that out. It's just it's really nice if you got bandwidth. Um, um, so what I wanted to show is, so you, you all know what this, this is the magical step that lasts like two hours in your net sequence, where you're actually running the in-place upgrade. So here it's showing the drivers, and then uh, the dynamic updates is part of there. Uh, resizing partition. So then there's this variable OS setup additional upgrade options, which allow you to like control the setup engine. Uh, so in that, we're you know saying that disable the diagnostic zone, set the priority high, and then you can see where that's actually in. And now this is taken from the actual SSEM. Oh, this is taken from the SMSTS log file. This is just the, the output from that. So you can actually see in that log file what command is actually being run. Um, so then you can see that the stuff you put in that variable is being actually appended down here. And like this checkbox not being checked is appending this to the setup engine, the dynamic update disabled. And then for instance, this area here is being appended to the install drivers and it points to the path. So that's how that is all being associated in your data sequence. So when you look at the log, you can figure out which part is uh, going to which part. So when you get, um, all right. So this is all taken from like the SMSTS log. This is right after the upgrade and it's showing like it pops back into the wet windows phase right here, pretty close to the end. Um, and then once the CM client comes back to life, you see those black boxes and it's doing some other things. Uh, and then once it reached the end of the actual path sequence, it gives control back over to the setup engine to finish and reach back to the desktop. Because if you notice, that during your test sequence, it states on the black screen, and then it lets Ubi finish once your test sequence is done. Um, and before the test sequence, it cuts in right in the beginning there. Uh, but it, right before it cuts into the setup engine, you actually see it installing the setup complete and the setup rollback uh, command files. Those are kept in the CCM folder. So you want to actually want to see what's happening. You can actually take a look at that and see what the config management team put in there. They're adding a couple changes for 1910. Yeah, 1910. If you actually, if you compare the files in that folder between like 1906 and 1910, you actually see a difference. They've added some um, nice little features to help improve your successful upgrade. Um, but yeah, so like right at the beginning of that, you'll see like your CM clients placed in provisioning mode. The CCM exec service is disabled, the TS manager service is disabled, the remote control service is disabled, and then it hands off the setup engine. Basically, it says config manager shut down, trust Windows setup installer until it hands back. So that's when if crap happens during setup engine, it never hands back and leaves your client completely forked because it never knew to come back to life. So that's why they're starting to do things like in 19. 06, they added the functionality where it pulls it back out of provisioning mode after 48 hours, and then eventually it will run CCM eval. The only bad thing is, is that it's still in the middle of the task sequence. So then you're going to be going to like software center, it's going to show like bad things still. So they're, they're getting closer, which is why we've had to build in a bunch of scripts to fix things. Um, but yeah, anyway, so there's a lot of information here, but this is kind of explaining it how the task sequence fits into the setup engine. So basically for that, quite a while, you're just left in the dark. It started the step, 
and then you actually now you actually get that percentage like the one through 99 and 100 percent and then your first reboot happens so you're actually not in the dark here it's just that really nothing's happening other than you see the percent increment and then this is the dark area and then here it comes back and you see your test sequence pop back in so then you get to learn those other areas pretty good when you're trying to troubleshoot and that's all in the panther logs um, yeah. Dark side of the moon. Dark side. Yeah, we're gonna skip. Is that that? We're gonna skip that. Nah, go, go back. What? Go back. One more. There. Uh, so there's a new variable that's in 1910. So oh, actually, this is an older slide. Um, that was in the release notes. Um, basically, what you can do is put a setup complete pause. So when it goes, finishes setup, it really runs that. Uh, set up complete on CMD file. It basically will insert a delay. Um, so there were some issues of where the task sequence engine couldn't get its feet back on the ground, and then the task sequence never resumed. Um, so we have a little uh, CMD file that we, or a little PowerShell file that we inject in, into that file because uh, we're still on 1906. We haven't gone to 1910 quite yet. Um, and we think it helped helps some. So it's a hard one to detect whether it helps or doesn't help. Um, just really flowing through these. Basically we have reports for everything for failures or uh, for success because we like to show off for successful. But um, the techs really want to know uh, and, and that's, that's the built-in reports which are really handy for the status messages. Um, and then we have a bunch of other ones. So like pre-flight failures, we they can see exactly like why it failed the pre-flight. Wasn't plugged in, didn't have enough storage, uh, whatever reason. And this is all custom created. So if I know it's failing for a reason, it actually is pulling information from that CI and just dumping that into the report saying this is the reason it failed. Um, rollbacks, we actually, the rollback scripts that I wrote for the process, um, based upon if it fails and it's in like phases one through four, uh, it triggers the rollback script and which then checks uh, a bunch of different things and then um, brings the client back to life, sets the status to rollback, and then it actually runs setup diag and dumps that information in the report too. So that hopefully it's enough information that they would know like, oh, odds are good that if you just rerun, it's gonna be fine due to like weird anomaly, anomalies. Otherwise, uh, it could be for a reason that we just know, like, this is never going to upgrade, so don't put any time into it. A uh, bunch of metrics that we keep. We see how long the test sequence ran for, how long the setup engine ran for, and then if we see, like, a huge variation between, like, the, the task engine and the setup, then we know, like, something was wonky on that task sequence. Typically, a task sequence runs for another five to ten minutes longer than the actual setup. Um, what we were seeing like for a little while, it, it wasn't sending status messages back. We tried to retry and then it would like take hours because each step would turn into like several minutes. Uh, so we basically just turned off the, or set the status to disable if, if it fails the first time. Um, and then set up rollback. So we run this on each, each upgrade, whether it fails or success, just because if we get some decent uh, metrics from it as well. But what's really nice is if it does fail, uh, depending upon like this error code, uh, I can pipe that to specific remediations. That if I know that this error code is because of this, I can put that in a report and I can put in like a, if, if I can't automate it, I can at least say, go to the machine and, and do X, Y, Z. Because they're never gonna figure this out themselves. So you gotta make it like, I'm not nothing against our support, but our first line support is just, answer the phone and make a ticket typically. So if I can put something in there that they can handle, then maybe it will get resolved. And then some of the errors I know are just like, um, this machine needs to be re-imaged, so then we just flag it for re-image and it comes out of the process. So setup diag, um, last year I, I thought it was useless, but they've uh, released several versions since then, and uh, I found it pretty valuable now. So, so 
to kind of close out a little bit. Lessons learned. Um, <laughs> start yesterday. Who started on 1909 yet? Anybody? A couple hands? Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, don't don't delay. You'll have plenty of delays along the way that you won't <laughs> be expecting. Um, don't assume changes are going to work, right? <laughs> test, 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 test again. Uh, don't touch production once you lock here. Code stuff. Um, or ask your app owners or your vendors to validate their maps, not just does it install on a net new install of 1909, but does it survive an in-place upgrade, right? I don't know what your guys' app success rates are, but yeah, we have some that just tend to be our, our thorn in our side. Uh, communicate with your end users, give them options, right? Um, let them know it's coming, let them know this is gonna be an annual event and not to be afraid of it. Right? Don't reboot it. Yeah, yeah, don't power it off in the middle. That's <laughs> that you will hunt them down. Um, no, maybe not that, but um, document your stuff, right? So you document it, you do something cool, document it. Like, nathan has got that initiative on the blog stuff. If you don't have a blog, hit him up. If you've done something cool, don't be afraid, put it out there. Yeah. We've got a bunch of mentors too who are ready to help. So. Yeah. so I'll just document it internally. The reason why I started writing blogs is because I forgot what I did. <laughs> and, uh, so I blog it. But it's always funny when you're doing a search on something and then your blog result comes back. And you're like, oh yeah, I wrote that like four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I do it. Yes. So, so no, it's, it's, it's beneficial in more than one way. Um, and train up your support staff, right? Um, teach them the fish. Hopefully they'll catch the fish. Otherwise you're going to be catching lots of fish if things don't go so well. Um, other than the apps, some other issues we've had were on the, along the lines of network issues like 802.1x. Anybody has 802.1x? So some weird things happening there on the post upgrade side work so well. Um, but I think that's the majority of it, and then the unexpected end user that says, oh, I didn't kick off the deployment. No, you didn't just kick off the deployment. You kicked it off and realized you didn't want to run it, so you powered it off uh, after it started. Uh, this one more metric we, we capture is, was it user initiated or was it a deadline? Because oftentimes, like, hey, how come this is running in the middle of my day? You jerks, and then um, we can pull up a report, like, you're the one that triggered it. Like, you clicked yes three times. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you're click happy, but. That, does that work? It usually are, they, them are they really happy with that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's like, I'm not going to yield that for doing something, but I'm not here. Right. <laughs> um, I didn't tell you to push yes three times. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but that's about it, really. Thanks. Next There it is. Huh. Questions? Or we'll give you the questions. You guys give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All the past sequence kind of demos you were doing. You can download a lot of those templates from Gary account, right? Yeah, that included demo is available on Gary account. I'm not going to claim this production ready by any means. I think it's from my lab, and I know I've got bugs, so I just haven't had time to re-script on them. But it does work as a demo. Um, and everything you just saw is there's a 1909 export. You're going to get some extra things that you might not want to do because I just haven't had time to clean it up. But you can just delete what you don't want. Make sure you go through and search, like on Gary Town, because we've heard of people that said, "Yeah, I implemented," and then people thought we got hacked because it started saying Gary Town. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 go through and change some of the variables. Yeah, please go through all the scripts. All the yeah. My name is plastered in quite a few places. So <laughs> people come in the next day and said, "Welcome to Gary Town." <laughs> <laughs> is the uh, OS rollback on your blog? Yep. Yep, it's part of the. I've got one. It's just one gigantic download. It's 
not large in size, but a lot of content. I dump all the content into big parts. So it's probably a 10 meg download or something, but it's, it's like 20 some test sequences, a bunch of package references, stuff like that. There's two parts though, because there's stuff that you have to do in the upgrade that plants a lot of that stuff, and then there's the actual sequences that do yeah. the OS on install. During the upgrade, you have to create the scheduled tasks that need to be there when you revert. So, uh, everything else I could inject from 1909 back into 1709, but I could not inject the scheduled task. Any other questions? Comments? We love trade. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs>